Tom? All right, so bang the gavel and get this going. Um, thanks to everyone for coming here. I have new contacts that I just put in two hours ago, and I don't need these, but I've been using these for two years. So if I'm constantly taking these off and putting them on, I'm getting used to the muscle memory now of not needing them, but I've been using them for two years. It feels a little strange. Okay, so first of all, we're going to do uh, our recognition of Ms. Deborah Young as Ms. Wheelchair Kansas 2017. Do you want to say something first, or do you want me to read the proclamation first? Whatever you prefer. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation, and then if you'd like to say a few things, you're welcome to, or you can do it beforehand, but I'll read it first if you like. I don't need these. It's so weird. <laughs> Whereas in 1972, the Ms. Wheelchair America program was established by Dr. Philip K. Wood, a Columbus, Ohio physician who devoted his career to the treatment and re rehabilitation of people with disabilities. And whereas the Ms. Wheelchair Kansas program was started in 2004 and held its first annual event in 2005, there have been 13 title holders since its creation in 2004 and was officially incorporated in 2015. And whereas Ms. Deborah Young was crowned as Ms. Wheelchair Kansas 2017 on March 19, 2017, and will serve as a role model, role model and spokesperson for people with disabilities in Kansas throughout the year. Now, therefore, I, Leslie Soden, Mayor of the City of Lawrence, Kansas, do hereby recognize Ms. Deborah, Mrs. Deborah Young as Ms. Wheelchair Kansas. Thank you. I'm going to go down there. to speak but you don't have to either can I just stay here you sure can okay that's good thank you thank you for having me I appreciate the recognition and the honor of being able to serve as Miss Wheelchair Kansas it's been a great experience thank you all right so now we're gonna roll into proclaiming Tuesday July 18th as the City of Lawrence, Kansas celebration of the 27th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Do we have anyone that's speaking beforehand? Come on up to the podium. Well, I'd like to speak after. Okay, I, I will go ahead and read this then. Whereas on July 26, 1990, President George H. Bush signed into law the Americans with Disabilities Act to ensure the civil rights of people with disabilities. This legislation established a clear and comprehensive national mandate for the elimination of discrimination against individuals with disabilities. And whereas the ADA has expanded opportunities for Americans with disabilities by reducing barriers and changing perceptions and increasing full participation in community life. However, the full promise of the ADA will only be reached if we continue our efforts to fully implement it. And whereas on this day, we in the city of Lawrence, Kansas, celebrate and recognize the progress, progress that has been made by reaffirming the principles of equality and inclusion and recommitting our efforts to reach full ADA compliance. Now, therefore, I, Leslie Soden, mayor of the city of Lawrence, Kansas, do hereby proclaim July 18, 2017, to be the city of Lawrence, Kansas celebration of the 27th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. principles of equal opportunity and full participation. We greatly appreciate all the City of Lawrence does to educate and enforce the non-discrimination provisions of city code, as well as Deborah Young's educational campaign that's having a positive statewide impact. Uh, and thank you for installing the accessible podium. We appreciate it. I'd like to speak just a moment about one of our most pressing challenges. Having good health care is a vital part of maintaining health so that we can participate in all aspects of life, 
We're very concerned about recent proposals in Congress to repeal the Affordable Care Act. By decimating Medicaid funding, tying tax subsidies to substandard plans, and repealing cost-sharing subsidies, people with disabilities and others with low income with, would be effectively priced out of access to adequate health care. Millions of people with disabilities, especially those who rely on Medicaid for health insurance, would lose services that allow us to go to school, work, and live in our communities and participate fully. Proposals to repeal the Affordable Care Act are a real threat to our life, liberty, and independence. We encourage everyone to communicate with our elected officials in Congress to ensure that all people have access to good health care. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, it was good to read that Senator Jerry Moran was one of the two senators, Republican senators, that decided not to go along with the repeal. So that just proves it's not a partisan issue that health care is really important for everyone. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go into our consent agenda. All matters listed below on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on those items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Are there any items that a member of the commission wishes to remove? No? Okay. Are there any items that a member of the audience wishes to remove? Okay. So uh, with the addition of claims, where we got, let's see which way is better here, a total of 224 vendors for a total dollar amount of $7,854,865.40. And we should note that two of those payments are over a million dollars, um, one to 360 Energy Engineers and one to Garney Companies, Inc. So with the addition of claims, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. So motion made by Vice Mayor Bully, seconded by Commissioner Amix. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right, so now we're going to be on to the regular agenda. Nope, first of all, we got to do public comment. I almost skipped it. All right, so addressing the commission, the public is allowed to speak to any items or issues that are not scheduled on the agenda after first being recognized by the mayor. As a general practice, the commission will not discuss debate these items, nor will the commission make decisions on items presented during this time. Rather, they will refer the items to staff for follow-up if necessary. Individuals are asked to come to the microphone, sign in, and state their name and address. Speakers should address all comments, questions to the commission. Hello, Frank. Frank Jensen, 33, New Hampshire. Could this come up or does it matter? Yeah, it goes up. There's a little um, up and down arrow on the right-hand side. There you go. Mayor Soden mentioned uh, Senator, uh, who was it? Moran. 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 You haven't heard the latest. Uh, that now they want to simply eliminate the uh, Affordable Care Act, and he is for that. Mm. Thank you, Frank. The other part, it's on the agenda here, but it hasn't been mentioned from the bench about what we had just now at Watkins Museum, 50th anniversary of the uh, Fair Housing Ordinance. Uh, at, at, at our recent NAACP meeting, we were discussing whether or not there is fair housing currently here in Lawrence. I had three other items. One is Peasley Tech, which we all honor very much. Uh, we support that, so whatever you can do, budget or third parties for Peasley Tech. Here in Lawrence with the University of Kansas, Haskell University, everything is labeled like university, we need to go to university, but high school students, as we know, uh, can go to the Technical Institutes to get good training. Second item is uh, renovation of the building which housed the uh, fire station there at uh, 8th and uh, Kentucky, the Art Deco cover, and the Senior Center. When I called Senior Center out there, where they're out near PZ Tech right now, and the woman said that she lives closer there, so it's better for her. For me, I live closer to downtown. 
the firemen there in the firehouse, a couple of months ago, they said it's supposed to be finished by the end of June, meaning they need a temporary uh, place there with water, sewer, electricity, internet access they're going to set up there for the people at that station to basically live there while they're doing the renovation. They thought the renovation was going to be beginning, end of June. Now they say it's going to be in August. So whenever you get that done, fine. Last item has to do with uh, conversation earlier today. I spoke with Jim Wisdom, who is the IT guy here at uh, City Hall. And we talked about different things that are going on with IT, including the fact that uh, Kevin Powell, who is one of the IT uh, directors, who deals with all kinds of things, including dozens and hundreds of laptops and smartphones that all the city has around the, around the city. Also mentioned Porter, who has now, among his other duties, since we kept him on, working with IT. And what I wanted to do was mention that with Dorothy and the, her three companions finally met the Wizard of Oz, and at one point Toto kind of moved around and he said, ignore that man behind the curtain. So what we do here every night is ignore Kurt Henning, who is behind the curtain over here. He is the one who basically does all the things, including getting anything onto the uh, internet. People out in the, in the audit, uh, out toward him here, he controls all kinds of things, and we need to honor him as well as the other city staff. Kurt, can you stand up? There's Kurt. Thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, my name is Kate Perry. I'm the chair of the Human Relations Commission. Um, I wanted to first thank you for acknowledging the 50th um, anniversary of the Fair Housing Ordinance in Lawrence. It's a really big deal. It's really cool. It was passed 50 years ago um, today. And um, I just want to thank you guys for that. Um, I also want to read a, a letter that the um, Human Relations Commission drafted at our last meeting. Um, we held a special meeting a week after our normally scheduled meeting. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions after that. We are, writing we are writing on behalf of the majority of the City of Lawrence Human Relations Commission. We are writing, we are a community board consisting of nine members drawn from diverse racial, ethnic, commercial, and other segments of the community appointed by the Mayor of Lawrence. Our purpose is to endeavor to eliminate prejudice among the various racial, ethnic, and other groups in the city and to further goodwill among all the people of Lawrence. In this capacity, we feel it's appropriate to speak out and share our sympathies with the families of Samuel DeBose, Sylvia Smith, Philandro Castile, Charlena Lyles, and the many others who have faced similar losses. We are concerned by continued reports of shootings of black individuals by police officers. Statistically, it's been noted that black individuals are nearly three times as likely to be shot and killed by the police, by police officers, as white individuals. Protests nationwide underscore frustration with the judicial process, process and cases of officers being criminally charged for their actions and subsequently acquitted. Lawrence experienced a similar tragedy with the killing of 19-year-old black KU student Rick Tiger Dowdell in 1970. 46 years later, retired Lawrence police officers and the family of Tiger Dowdell acknowledged the shooting and shared their experiences at an event sponsored by the Human Relations Commission. The city manager, Tom Marcus, has an opportunity to select a new chief of police. We sincerely hope that in these deliberations, he will choose a law enforcement leader who acknowledges the magnitude of these issues and the importance of avoiding the perception or application of prejudice and injustice in our community. We acknowledge that for many members of the Lawrence community, the justice system is not working and they are justifiably fearful and angry with the current state of affairs. We hear you, see you, and believe your experience. Our meetings occur the third Thursday of February, May, August, and November at 5.30 p.m. in the Carnegie Library building. We welcome the opinions of the public, either in this space or by attending our meetings in person. Respectfully, the City of Lawrence Human Relations Commission. We also have an open position on our board, and so if anyone is interested um, in applying or being a member of the commission, um, you can reach out to, you apply through, it's like online, um, or you can reach out to the city attorney's office who um, houses our commission. 
Um, and anyone can attend our meetings, um, any member of the public um, with any concerns or issues you think that would be relevant to the commission, we uphold the civil rights code of the city. So. Thank you, Kate. Thanks. Any other public comment? Uh, Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, uh, one uh, public commenter came forward and spoke about the Muslim rite or ceremony of Ramadan. That is completely wrong. This is not a forum for religious advocacy or advertisement. This is a forum for the city's business. And it was a wrong for you all to sit there and allow that to go forward. It's not proper. We have to keep that separation of church and state or whatever it is at a hard line. The other thing that happened at that meeting was that uh, there was a, a presentation on the 9th Street Corridor, I believe. And we had about as I understand it, there was about four, this has been going on for about four years, there have been numerous meetings, but yet at that evening, there must have been a parade of like 7,000 commenters, I exaggerate, uh, come forward and comment on it. Well, we don't have time for that. They've had time for their input over many years. So to take up this commission's time, to take up the public's time with having the people come forward in mass and, and each one commenting on what they should have had a chance to comment on before is just plain wrong. Now whether or not the, somebody's politics was to allow these people to, uh, you know, give them airtime, I don't know. The other thing is, uh, this came in the uh, email the other day. It has something to do with the uh, City of Lawrence Post letter in response to editorial. I can't make heads or tails of this. I have no idea what this is. I, I just tried to open in some of it or something and I just, I threw up my hand. Because this type of business is ridiculous. This puts the average person in a very bad position of trying to understand what the city is doing. Last uh, weekend there was a uh, public forum on uh, commissioner candidates for the upcoming uh, primary election. One of, the cam one of the candidates is uh, Commissioner Herbert, who is uh, running for re-election. In his remarks, he said that he was a school teacher. I looked up on his uh, statement of substantial interests and see that he is the owner of a company called Residential Property Management. Well, what is that? He's a 100% owner. If that has to do with real estate properties, rental properties in the city, he should have disclosed that and said that publicly. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. You are a school teacher. I work at Lawrence High every day. <laughs> but yes, Dan, I do own Renaissance Property Management. You can talk to him later about what that I'd be is. Be happy to talk to you about that anytime you'd like. Any other public comment? Okay, so now we're on to the regular agenda. Sorry about that, Diane. All right, so 
The public is allowed to speak to any regular agenda item or give public comment. After first being recognized by the mayor, individuals, individuals are asked to come to the microphone, sign in, and state their name and address. Speakers should address all comments, questions to the commission. So first up, we have conduct a public hearing for Van Trust Real Estate, LLC, Catalyst Incentive Package, and consider the following items related to the request. Good evening, Mayor Commissioner. Diane Stoddard, Assistant City Manager. Uh, several months ago, you all adopted the Catalyst Program with the idea of spurring economic development in Lawrence, um, particularly um, in Lawrence Venture Park and, and elsewhere in the community. Um, and I'm pleased that we're here this evening in order for you to formally consider the first application uh, related to that program. Uh, the Van Trust team is here this evening, and um, they'll be talking about their their project. They are proposing over a total of 500,000 square feet of spec industrial space um, in Lawrence Venture Park, and um, they'll be covering that with you. Um, at the conclusion of their remarks, uh, then I will come back and just briefly highlight for you some of the major points of the agreement with Van Trust that's before you this evening and the other um, documents that are in front of you this evening. So uh, I would also like to acknowledge um, we have here with us this evening um, Gary Anderson from Gilmore and Bell, the city's bond council, and David Waters with Lathrop, Lathrop and Gage, who also assisted the city um, in the in the discussions about the agreements. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Grant Harrison with uh, Van Trust, and he will uh, introduce his team and then also talk about the project. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Grant Harrison, as Diane said, with Van Trust Real Estate, 4900 Main Street, Kansas City, Missouri, 64112. Um, quickly, I'd, I'd like to thank all of city staff for all their time over the last really year that we've had meetings with them in the last month or so getting us to this point tonight. And uh, we're glad to be here and uh, thrilled to potentially be doing a project in, in Lawrence. Um, with me tonight, I have Dave Harrison with Van Trust Real Estate, the president. I also have Rich Muller. Carl Lay and Bryce Harrison with Van Trust, and our uh, civil engineering partner with Bartlett and West, Darren Amon. And we're here to answer any questions after our, our quick presentation. Um, so I'll turn it over to Dave real quick for a, a quick overview of who we are and uh, what we do. Bear with me. Good evening. As uh, Grant mentioned, my name is David Harrison, uh, 4900 Maine, Kansas City, Missouri, as well. I'm president of Van Trust, and I'm going to just give a real quick overview of, of who we are. Uh, we were formed in May of 2010 as Camus. Uh, we're a full service real estate development and acquisition company. We're headquartered in, uh, in Kansas City. Uh, we've got offices in Columbus, Ohio, Jacksonville, Dallas, and Phoenix. Uh, we've done a little more than $1.8 billion worth of uh, development along with some acquisitions since forming the company in 2010. Uh, all of us here represent uh, the Van Tile family, uh, Larry Van Tile, is uh, is the if if we had a title, he'd be our chairman. Uh, but uh, the Van Tile family is uh, who we are fiduciaries to. We do a lot of office uh, development, a lot of industrial, infill, multifamily. We've got one hotel under our belt, and we. Uh, we also deal with a lot of land from a, uh, from a horizontal land development standpoint. And uh, we, we don't do any construction ourselves. We've bifurcated construction uh, risks away from development risk. And we, we don't go out and raise capital. We, uh, we do everything, all our developments uh, without financing contingencies, and uh, we do that on behalf of the Van Tile family. 
you want to uh, talk sure. about a few of the cities we're in? So again, we're, we're based in Kansas City. We do have um, offices in Phoenix, Dallas, Columbus, Ohio, and Jacksonville, Florida. Um, backing up to the team real quick, as mentioned, um, we have a, a big group of people who will touch this project, all of which are here tonight. Um, Brett Sheffield is not. Um, he is head of our development services division. Um, but we have the manpower to do this and are, are thrilled uh, to be able to take this on. Um, backing up to those, those different offices, uh, throughout the different product types, we've had the ability to work with about 35 different municipalities, and hopefully after tonight's discussion, uh, we'll add 36 to that list. Um, we have touched, since 2010, about 12.5 million square feet of industrial. We would consider that Class A institutional grade quality. Um, throughout the country, this is just an example of a few of those projects. Uh, these can range from 77,000 square feet up to a million square feet. So we've touched a little bit of everything. Um, all of which, but two projects, were all on a speculative basis. As it relates to the Venture Park project, uh, we're here pursuing uh, the control over three different sites, um, ultimately three different phases uh, within Block B and, and Block A. Uh, the first two phases would consist of two sister buildings. Uh, they'd be about 152,000 square feet apiece, and these would be uh, rear-loaded buildings separating the auto park and office entries from the, the dock um, and drive-in capabilities on the, on the back sides. The, the third phase and project would be about a 250,000 square foot building, so obviously just a, a bigger um, product type than the first two. All of these, again, would be an institutional grade, uh, very flexible on who we could attract, and they'd be um, able to divide probably up to three to five tenants depending on what we see in the market. Uh, here's just a quick view um, of an image of, of the three buildings dropped in to scale. A very rough um, image, but gives you an idea, um, looking north, uh, how these buildings could lay out. Um, again, following tonight's discussion and hopefully signing the, the transfer agreement, we're ready to attack due diligence um, and really get this thing going and, and tee up phase one, building one, and uh, start attracting uh, new, new clients. So we turn it over to any questions. Okay. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. So, uh, Grant um, or, or Dave, anybody, is it our goal here then to uh, uh, attract multiple tenants here and not maybe just one big one? We would love to have three tenants between all three of those buildings. Right. Um, again, depending on the market and, and what's going on, we need to be able to prepare to, to do multi-tenant buildings. But we would absolutely love to have single tenants with, with a bunch of jobs, but more than likely, these will be smaller tenants in those first two buildings, and we could potentially go down to 30,000 square foot users or, again, up to the single 150,000 square foot user. So we just don't know yet. Okay. Well, I do want to apologize to you real quick. We didn't get the uh, transfer agreement until about 4.20 this afternoon, and, and to be very honest with you, I haven't had a chance to look at it. Not uh, a problem at all. We, we spent a lot of time on it, and we were going back and forth as well, so okay. we understand. Appreciate that. Yeah. That's all I have right now. I think one thing that people um, – ask about is that this is private investment on your part this isn't a public investment and i mean it is in terms of the land and incentives you may ask for but it's not us developing the land it's it's you putting your money into it and i think that's one per misperception that we've been having with people no that it's correct uh, we won't we'll, we'll have an individual entity form for each building but all the capital uh, it will be private from one source, and that would be the Van Tile family. When you talk about a phased approach, what sort of time frame are you looking at? D depending, so on the, on the first phase, I'll focus on that for a second. Again, we'll, we'll get into the site and, and <coughs> physical due diligence. We'll get this first building designed and start working through the city. Uh, we'll work with the chamber and local uh, brokerage firms to really form that mousetrap and make sure all the specs are correct. Um, depending on the weather here in Kansas, I don't know if we could start this fall, but we'd probably start early spring next year and get going on this thing as quick as possible. A building of this size would probably take about 10 months, 11 months to complete the shell um, without tenant improvements or any tenants in tow. 
Uh, so the goal would be, again, to get this thing going early next year, if not sooner. But we just have to see how the due diligence goes. Now, my, it's my understanding that the special assessments for all of these properties out there will be paid by the property owner. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Mayor. Go ahead. And in that agreement, is that a 20-year or 10-year assessment on the, on the specials? Ten, 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 ten years. Twenty. Twenty. Okay. Is that part of the agreement? And it is part of the agreement that they do pay the special assessments. The assessments, of course, are for the roads. Any infrastructure that we've laid down already. Correct, Mayor. Mm -hmm. If you'd like to, I'd be happy to kind of go through a few yeah. of those points for you if you'd like. That'd be great. Okay. <clears throat> um, just a couple comments about this project. Um, as, as Grant mentioned, um, it would be in the three phases uh, that would follow sequentially after one another. So the, with the first phase obviously coming first and then each subsequent phase about nine months after the completion of the, of the phase ahead. Um, we have built in some protections in the agreement that you have before you that the property won't transfer until such time a building permit uh, would be pulled um, and that is again part of the catalyst program um, the uh, catalyst program also provides uh, the land at no cost uh, for the project and a 50 percent or 70 percent 10-year property tax abatement um, it would be 70% uh, if it would meet lead silver equivalent standards at the time it's constructed. And then of course, industrial revenue bond financing would be included and there's documents related to that um, in your uh, consideration this evening. In order to accommodate the spec development, the, there, is no, there are no performance requirements as there typically are under the city's economic development policy, except for to construct the project and to continue to be current on the payment of the uh, pilot payments or the, the, um, the share due of the property taxes and also uh, pay the special assessments. Uh, but there won't be any job creation targets or wage uh, threshold uh, targets at this point because of course with spec development those things are not known yet at this point. The developer will be responsible for the special assessments as was mentioned and um, uh, some of the other highlights of the land transfer and development agreement that are ahead of you is um, each phase would provide for uh, 12 calendar months to begin construction after a building is per permit is issued. Um, there's nine months period for the second and third phase and 24 months then from the time a building permit is pulled to complete uh, that shell and the site improvements um, so that it would be ready to uh, be occupied by a tenant at that point. Um, during the time that the building is um, being constructed and construction is happening until the point that the, the project is completed, the city would retain a reversionary interest in the property um, in the event that the developer um, fails to commence construction within that period or complete the project. Um, so with that reversionary interest, that's a protection for the city that in, in the event the project doesn't occur, then the property can revert back to the city with our intention, of course, being that it would be um, to productive use. The uh, city would retain responsibility under the agreement for any pre-existing environmental conditions even after the property transfer. So those would continue on. That's no different than our current obligations um, on the property, but they would continue after the property would be transferred as it relates to those pre-existing conditions. Um, um, as I mentioned uh, in your documents this evening, you have um, industrial revenue bond uh, documents and um, under which a Van Trust would receive a 10-year property tax abatement, again, in the amount of either the base 50% or 70%, depending if the uh, building is ultimately constructed to lead silver level equivalencies and then with industrial revenue bonds the project would get a sales tax exemption on materials that would be used in construction 
and uh, there's two resolutions of intent for you this evening. One of them is a blanket resolution that covers all three phases, so it indicates the city's intent to issue bonds for each of those phases, anticipating that each of the phases individually would have their own resolution of intent that would come before you. So the other resolution of intent uh, that's in front of you this evening deals with just the first phase of development. Uh, again, each, each phase would have its own resolution of intent at the appropriate time when it's ready to move forward and that would enable each of the phases to receive its own 10-year property tax exemption and the sales tax exemption that I mentioned. Um, at the completion of each phase at the time when the value of the building is known, and of course then it will be known whether uh, it's been constructed to the lead silver equivalency standards, uh, there will be a pilot payment schedule that would be negotiated between the city and the developer that would be part of a performance agreement and the developer would be required to pay um, that pilot that would be roughly equivalent of a um, a 50 again or 70 percent abatement and they would be paying the remainder either 50 or 30 percent of the property taxes due under that schedule. Um, in order to maintain the abatement then through the 10-year period, as I mentioned, their, their requirement would be to uh, continue to pay the pilot payments on, in a timely manner and then also pay the special assessments. So that is kind of a high level um, of the summary for you of the agreements and documents that you have in your packet for consideration this evening. Any follow-up questions for Diane? I have one. Um, I've gotten some correspondence from citizens about why we are not continue, continuing to try to find um, businesses that would actually buy the land. Could you give me a little bit of history about what we've done to try to get industry out there? Yes, Commissioner, and certainly those things do continue. Um, we, um, we have been marketing the property along with the chamber uh, that serves as our marketing arm and um, we're responding to inquiries on a regular basis with projects that have an interest um, um, and uh, in, in putting the property out there. So that is still very much a possibility. Uh, there was interest, however, in putting this catalyst program together um, really to address the issue that our, our economic development policy, as you recall, didn't handle spec industrial development very well because of the requirements of knowing the job creation figures mm -hmm. and the wage figures and that kind of thing up front at the beginning of the project. Uh, so the intention of putting that program together was certainly to catalyze a, a project and, an al and also enable this particular kind of uh, spec development. And we knew that there was interest in this kind of development in Lawrence to try and be able to facilitate that. But, but there certainly is the door open on the traditional economic development um, um, project on the remaining lots, and that would still be a very viable alternative in the future. And as you know, this, the Catalyst program is, is really aimed at a, sp a specific time, so it's only lasting two years from the time that you all passed it in the spring. So how, before the Catalyst program, how long have we been trying to get businesses out there? And was well, really, since, um, since even before we had the infrastructure in, um, it's, uh, it's been um, our major community um, source of, of land to respond to inquiries. I think there's one other large um, industrial lot in the, in the community that's also um, been marketed as part of response to those those inquiries, but um, but we've really been actively um, uh, working on it. And as you know, we had um, the Menards project that had mm -hmm. had a uh, for how long? Been Three, five years? Have we been trying oh, to get Trencher Park filled? The, all the infrastructure was done, Chuck. In what year? Fourteen. Fourteen. So it, but we, even, we've been marketing it for three to four years. That, that would be safe and to we've say. we've got no response. I mean, we've, I know we've oh. shown the property, but we just haven't had anybody actually take a bite. Is that correct? You're correct. So about three or four we, years. Okay. Except we for negotiated Menards. a deal with Menards. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah except yeah. with the Menards. Menards they, yeah. they just haven't, haven't moved forward at this right. point, but yes. Right. 
Okay. Thanks. Can, can I add something? To sure. That? Sure. It seems like in this cycle, especially on the industrial side, uh, having product up, whether it's a for a tenant or an owner user, uh, it seems like in all the markets that we're in, you've got to have something going vertical to to attract. The, the build of suits where someone comes in and uh, a user finds a raw piece of ground and works through that process, uh, those are fewer and far between today. Uh, and we're building this as a lease product, but if a user comes along and wants to, to, to buy that, uh, we, we just sold a 515,000 foot building in uh, Olathe to, uh, to an international company. They didn't want a lease, so we sold it to them. Uh, we just sold a 600 plus thousand square foot uh, facility to Kroger in the Ohio Valley. And it was for lease, but they wanted to own it. So uh, I, we want to be able to attract those users and those companies whether it's a lease or for sale. But you gotta get stuff out of the ground in this market, it seems, to get somebody's attention. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, let's go to public comment then. Um, we'll do public comment, and then if there's something that you wanna add to that afterwards, you can, but we usually let everyone speak all at once. Not at the same time at the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so public comment, um, just come up and sign in and state your name and uh, tell us what you think. Mayor, excuse me, would yes. you mind um, officially opening the public hearing? Oh yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Oh, there it Thank is down at the bottom. Okay, so I'll go ahead and move to conduct the public hearing and approve, or uh, conduct the public hearing. <laughs> is there a okay. second? All right, so motion made by Mayor Soden, seconded by Vice Mayor Bully. All those in favor, say hi. Uh, anyone opposed motion passes unanimously all right thank you thank so you. now we can do public comment Frank Jansen again this may be a side issue and I don't know whether these gentlemen are aware of the controversy surrounding the 19th Street coalition which would perhaps either block or add access to the northwest corner of this property so just keep that in mind thank you Frank any other public comment did you sign in, Frank? Or I guess you already did before. They already have one even had it. Okay. Uh, Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Uh, I would like, I, I don't know what position Lawrence is in. We have Topeka to the west who, uh, to the best of my knowledge, gave away the farm to get Mars Candy Company and Bimbo Bakery uh, to locate there. On our east, we have the intermodal facility at Gardner, and I just wonder where Lawrence fits in uh, with those two bookends. Are we at some kind of disadvantage um, given our position and situation? Perhaps, uh, and what types of businesses uh, would, would locate here? It looks from the schematic there that we're considering warehouses and uh, things of that nature. But I, perhaps there are other types of businesses that uh, might be attracted. Thank you, Dan. Any other public comment? Sure, come on up, sign in and tell us what you think. <clears throat> My name's Nelson Kruger at 4308 Wimbledon Drive here in Lawrence, Kansas. We've lived here since 1967. I would just be curious if this project uh, were not acceptable, when would the Lawrence citizens be expected to begin paying the property taxes upon the uh, infrastructure that has currently been uh, put in place? Right. You want to answer well, the, the special? You're talking about the special assessments? Yes. The, those are um, obligations that you just recently took action on and levied, so immediately. 
that would be those those payments would be beginning and we budgeted those for next year and so what is that amount roughly 9.7 million so the new property taxes would be expected to cover an additional 9.7 million dollars if this project were found unacceptable is that cr true well the the total of the entire park um, is um, is the large number that Commissioner Herbert mentions um, and uh, those are scheduled budgeted to be paid over time over a 20-year period um, by either the property owner which in this case the city is the largest owner um, there the county also owns some lots in Venture Park but um, to the extent that they can be transferred to another party that obligation can be transferred thank you thank you thank you Nelson any other comment okay so there were a couple was there another person hold on a sec there's a couple other questions I think um, one of them before we get to back to grant um, the 19th Street corridor uh, I assume they're already aware that of that kind of road project looking to go in I don't know if they are um, the night the plan um, of course the master plan calls for an additional access to 19th Street mm -hmm. um, as it's currently constructed and the improvements to 19th Street are in the capital improvements program as it stands and um, whether or not the city moves forward with that project is a discussion I think coming up during your budget discussions but at this point anyway it's in the recommended um, plan to make that connection to 19th and do the improvements mm -hmm. okay all right so let's have you grant um, I think it would be good for people to hear how Lawrence does kind of fit in and what kind of businesses might be interested in locating here I assume that you would obviously have that information sure <laughs> uh, real quick I don't think Lawrence is at a disadvantage um, geographically uh, I think the disadvantage right now is to Dave's earlier comment there's not product type especially new product type available um, for growth and and attraction here in Lawrence I think there's about a 10 million square foot industrial market here in in Lawrence and I believe there's about a 2 percent vacancy which is very very low uh, versus versus Kansas City uh, which is about a six and a half percent vacancy so we feel this could be uh, local companies who want to grow and stay in Lawrence um, having this product up and available will keep them here you could pull some people from Kansas City you could pull from pe people from Topeka um, you can meet the needs of both those places from Lawrence too so I think uh, with the access um, now with the new uh, K10 um, extension I think this is a good spot and um, with the city's help I think we can really attract people and put a nice product out there so um, again more local um, to Lawrence distributors uh, jump into who can be here um, it could be food and beverage it could be e-commerce it could be basic distribution logistics um, it could be a pharmaceutical company it could be an office user uh, needing a couple uh, dock doors for storage um, all of these buildings because they're rear loaded and have the office on one side and the auto parking on one side can be a, a really nice entry uh, for these users and uh, gives them the flexibility again to, to have the docks and storage on the back side so um, we can really meet a lot of different users needs um, with these three buildings so that helps at all mm -hmm. were there any other questions that you thought that you needed to answer those were the ones that I had I don't believe so I think that's it so okay I had a question okay. yeah. sure Go ahead. Yeah. Um, what's your projected time frame for for getting tenants into the building do you have do you guys ever put together modeling on that we're always guessing and we're normally wrong uh, whether good or bad uh, we've had circumstances where we um, sign a, a full building tenant before we get the the TCO on the shell and during construction mm -hmm. we've had other circumstances this building's been here for six months or a year and the tenants trickle in we just don't know until we get it up um, but the second we start going through the city in terms of, of planning and permitting we'll have a brokerage team and our marketing team and the city and the chamber marketing the space and making sure everybody um, here here's about it and we're on everybody's radar so hopefully uh, we get it done pretty quick so we just don't know though okay thanks go ahead Mike 
Well, Grant, uh, question real quick. Uh, uh, obviously, you've looked at Lawrence uh, over a several year period. You just didn't, you know, show up one day and say this is it. Um, uh, what do you feel like, uh, uh, do you have people that you have contacts with that really have interest in Lawrence, Kansas, and people that you're working with now that you might be able to bring in or maybe not share right now, but, but people of interest that you have? Again, we, we typically, on really every project and every product type, we hire a third-party uh, brokerage firm. So we don't have any brokerage firms in-house or brokerage in-house. Um, we try to spread uh, the brokerage around each or all different companies so we're seeing everybody's tenants and uh, requirements. Um, so we don't control or, or really meet with those tenants directly. We, we work with the brokerage communities uh, to do that and attract that. But we don't at this point have anybody in tow uh, targeting this. But we do have people interested and, and very excited about the project, um, whether contractors, designers, and local brokers as well. So it's on their radar already. Are the brokers local or are they out in the area? Uh, both. So we haven't selected a team yet, but um, we'll do our due diligence and make sure we get the best team. So, okay. if, if I'm doing the math right, you're sitting on about a half million square feet of industrial there. Mm -hmm. Do you obviously it depends how the buildings get thrown together and, and, and whatnot, but do you have an idea of projected assessed valuation on the three properties combined? Uh, we're talking about a 30 million, 32 million dollar total project cost between the three. Um, we don't know how that will be valued once they're done. But that's I guess what, where I'm going with that question might be more for city staff than for you even. I'm, I'm trying to figure out, assuming we're operating on um, a 50% 10 year, what, what are we looking at in terms of property tax collection on that, of that 50% roughly? Do we, just Britt, do you have that or? tax projections, but I can tell you what the valuation um, that I got from the county appraiser um, for the, for just building one, um, I think the capital investment is about $10.2 million. And you know, the, the county appraises on the income uh, method. So they were using a shell uh, to value this and they were valuing it at a little over 6.8 million. Um, at just the shell level okay. and uh, so and that's just for one one of the that's three structures? just for one yeah what value did they put on the land I am not sure what they put on I think the value they put on the land was probably what the appraised value was back when all did the appraisal and I don't recall offhand how much that value was. Um, oh, here we go. I did, I did use it because I ran a few initial cost benefit numbers. $220,000 uh, for the, for the uh, first phase lot. And the first phase, is that one of the 125000 or is that the quarter million? That's one of the 150,000 square foot, about 12 acres, I believe. Okay. Any other questions? I got one more. On the um, environmental side, are we doing any baseline sampling or baseline work to make sure? We have um, a lot of that completed. The, this site has been, um, I've heard it stated that it's one of the most heavily environmentally characterized pieces of property. We have um, a, a lot of reports on the, the environmental conditions there. And of course, um, you know, it's subject to a consent order. So we have a lot of data on, um, on the site as a whole and um, also individual lots. Okay. So we'll have adequate baseline data be be right before the property transfer. Is that, is that what you think? Yeah, Chuck's saying yeah. We, yeah. And we are regularly um, working on the, okay. on the project and its okay. remediation efforts as well. Okay, right Chuck? You have anything more to add? Okay, thanks. The liability is currently ours. Yeah, no, that's why I'm asking still. If they add to it, 
not that you would, I'm not saying you're going to, but if they do any sort of processing there that could add to it, we want to be able to separate that out. <clears throat> Did you have a question? No, I was just wondering if we're still in, public, uh, in a public hearing or if we're coming back. Do we need to close the public hearing then? Uh, I, I don't know, I guess I got a question for staff. Um, what part of the 9.7 do these properties, or the special assessments, what portion of that does this represent? The, uh, the total for all of the properties um, involved in all three phases is uh, just a little over 1.8 million in special assessments. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, it sounds like our questions are finished. So let's, do you want to make the motion to close I the I move we hearing? close the public hearing. I'll second it. All right, so motion made by Vice Mayor Bowley, seconded by uh, Mayor Soden. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so the public hearing is now officially technically closed. Thank you, Stuart. All right, so any other committee uh, deliberations that you want to make, any discussion? I personally am really excited to have um, job development here, development that's solely based on job creation. You know, we have a lot of interesting controversies surrounding real estate development, but this is specifically for jobs, so I'm very excited about that. Yeah, this, this is a really good opportunity, but I, I do want everybody to understand we got this transfer to, uh, agreement late in the day, and, and the public hasn't seen it uh, because they would have gotten it about the same time that we did. I think that we should move, um, you know, at least a little bit of uh, having the opportunity for the public to be able to read through this thing. Is there uh, a first and second hearing kind of thing with this? Um, that was an no. anticipated, but um, that's up to the commission to to decide if you would like to um, either move forward with it this evening or or um, schedule it for a, a um, an upcoming meeting. Mm -hmm. What do you all think? I think Mike's got a good point. Mm -hmm. I think people need to have a chance to look at the agreement if they want to. Um, i got to believe Diane was tired of hearing from me over the last 24 hours about <laughs> this agreement where it was. And, yeah. and most of it had to do with the fact is that, you know, we've all, we all very supportive of the transparency and making sure that, um, you know, uh, the public has the opportunity to see all documents that we're getting ready to sign. This, uh, this is a project that is very good for this community and something that we, we need to be doing. But at the same time, too, we've, we've got a responsibility to make sure that, you know, we have everything available uh, for everybody to be able to see in, you know, a reasonable time, not 40 minutes before we meet or an hour before we meet. So I think, um, um, you know, our intent, you know, we can give our feelings about it, which I think is probably all going to be positive. But um, I still think that there needs to be opportunity for, um, you know, comment or additional comment as this is out there yeah, I think not I mean obviously for for the public as well but there it is a little concerning to me that our meeting started at five o'clock and we received a 27 page document at 415 you know that's that's a problem um, I think this this project's going to be positive I think it's going to help us chip away at that 9.7 million dollar taxpayer burden that we're about to run into uh, but it's it's slightly less than convenient to get a 27 page document 45 minutes before our meeting starts and be expected to have a, a reasonable reasoned conversation about it um, I just think that we would probably be making a mistake if we found something out after the fact and, and you know I don't don't want to really vote for something and read it later so yeah. I think that's reasonable I, I think it's an excellent program we're doing and, and the project looks really really good um, for the community and it has said we're chipping away at that special assessment and starting to get some life out here which is what we sorely need but yeah I, I i appreciate the application and uh, this is where we need to go uh, we need to fill venture park um, and Again, I appreciate the application. Um, 
I'm interested in taking a look at the agreement and having the public have a chance to do that. Um, and I guess the thing that's hardest for me on this deal is, is giving the land away. Um, that's been an issue for me from day one on the commission. And it just got harder because we get to keep the environmental baseline. <laughs> so this is a tough one for me, but I think it's the right thing to do. I just want to take a look at the agreement. So it looks like our next meeting is August 1st. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I don't think you have to feel guilty about um, kicking it over for another meeting. Uh, it certainly is never the staff's intent to deliver something this late. I can tell you there were earnest uh, negotiations going on with this project right up until that time. I've had, I haven't had a chance to get down into this agreement either. And I think, um, I think the developer uh, understands that. I think our chamber partner understands that, that the fair thing to do in terms of transparency to the public and to um, everybody having a chance to review it is to defer the action until the next meeting. I would respond as well to Commissioner Boley's comment about the land. I understand that that's a, that's a hurdle for you, but I would also tell you that you may be sitting on that land for a long time. <laughs> but that's and, and that is not doing us any good either right. because this will result in development. This will result in jobs. We can't spec those jobs at this point, but there are performance indicators built into this. And so the, the kind of the, the, the change, and I think Mr. Dannenberg's comments were appropriate. Where do we fit in all of this competition okay. between the two bookends? I think that's very appropriate. And I think we have to kind of look at things differently. The whole concept that, that the committee that kind of talked about these issues came up with was, we're not in the game. And it was, I think it was Marilyn Bittenbender, uh, Bittenbender said, you know, we lost uh, a business expansion from our local business to another jurisdiction because our inventory is so short for this kind of space. And this is a, this is a, uh, a development concept that we now call Catalyst that's created this opportunity to fill maybe a gap. You know, we're all hopeful in this country that manufacturing, you know, returns to the heyday of manufacturing and, and expansion, but it doesn't look like that's on any immediate horizon at this point. So I think we have to be kind of more progressive and, uh, and aggressive in terms of our efforts to make this happen. So I support this program, but I also support complete transparency. And I just want you to understand that staff never wants to put the commission in the position that you get something this late. Um, this was in due diligence and, and serious negotiation right up to the last minute. And of course, we, our schedule tonight doesn't really allow for you to, you know, to get into it any sooner. So I guess my question on that, Tom, is, uh, and I appreciate your, your words of counsel on my hang up about giving the land away, but do we need to do the public hearing again? The next well, time that's, we bring it up? I think that's up. a legal question. I was thinking the same so, thing. I, I asked legal counsel, they said a deferred motion would be okay. But I think, I think in all due respect to the process. We should have the public We'd have hearing public again. comment, but we don't have to do a public hearing. Well, I, uh, I, I don't, don't you know, I think it's, it's going, you know, the nice thing would be is if we just go through the motions again, okay? And that we don't resurrect some other major issue that gets found as yeah. we pour through the agreement. Yeah. But the reality is, I think the public hearing is is connected to the whole transparency issue. Right. I just don't know about the timing and what the appropriate motion would be. So I would yeah. ask that you allow legal counsel to maybe weigh in on it. It would seem like we have public comment whether we had a public hearing or not. So you would anyway. Yeah. But I. Dave, did you were you wanting to add something? Is it? Is it okay? Sure. Yeah, that's fine. I just uh, I want to thank all the attorneys and staff and everybody who's been working on this. I think most of what the delay was, it was trying to get more clarity on the environmental 
we're not here tonight on behalf of Van Trust pushing for a vote or or wanting to diminish any transparency. So we're we're great with it, but all the staff and everybody's been working real hard trying to get it. But we're we're not pushing for anything less than absolute transparency and, and comfort. Thank you, Dave. Okay. Anderson, Council for the city on the question of the uh, public hearing the public hearing is a statutorily required process with respect to the proposed tax abatement related to the bonds that statutory process requires publication of notice and mailed notice to both the county and the school district all of which occurred in connection with tonight's public hearing um, there's no statutory requirement for you to have another public hearing if you decide to defer the resolutions of intent. That, of course, does not preclude you from taking public comment, holding a public hearing if you so desire, uh, in order to take public input with respect to the post proposed transaction, because I think the tax abatement is tied into the land transfer agreement. It's you know one transaction so I wouldn't recommend that you do the statutory process over again but you can take public input however you did like if you decide to defer the matter and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any thank you any questions okay thank you here all right so August 1st we have room on the agenda for that <laughs> everything else <laughs> I'm sure the budget will just go like that. <laughs> okay, so we're going to, do we need to officially defer? I move we defer this? to okay. uh, August 1st. Second. All right, motion made by Vice Mayor Bowley, seconded by Commissioner Amix. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any <clears throat> opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for coming. We're going to take a Thank quick five-minute break. <laughs>
was me last week. There it is, found it. All right. All right. Yeah, no, when to start at the W. <laughs> All right, so now we are officially back. So now we're on to number two. Consider approving the City of Lawrence Parking System Operations and Development Plan. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Brandon McGuire, Assistant to the City Manager. Um, I know we have a rather relatively light agenda compared to what we have been experiencing lately, so I thought I'd take the opportunity since the last time uh, this issue was before you, um, I believe we started talking at about 11.45 p.m., um, so we maybe didn't have <laughs> uh, quite as, as robust of a conversation as, as we had hoped to at that time, uh, especially considering we had other items after that. Um, so I wanted to take a little bit more time with this presentation this evening uh, and really walk through um, the recommendations in this plan um, in the report and uh, give you all a chance to deliberate, ask any additional questions uh, that you have of the report, um, as well as the public who are here interested in the report. Um, our consultants are here as well um, this evening. Uh, this is their third time here uh, before the City Commission, so um, hopefully, uh, hopefully this is their last, not that we don't enjoy having them in town, but we do hope to, to bring the, um, the process to completion uh, this evening. Brandon, I had a quick question. Yes. So this is pretty much the same thing. Yes. That, Cause we did talk about some, um, issues with the last time that we talked about it, but this doesn't incorporate any of the things that we talked about a few weeks ago or when this is the same plan. So the, okay. yeah, the, um, the changes that were made to the report itself, uh, there were no changes that were identified in the recommendations that, that needed to be made to the actual recommendations. Um, so I'm taking the recommendations, that's the, that's the plan part of, the, that's the second half of the report, that's the plan. Uh, the changes that were made were more um, technical changes to the, to the first half of the report, um, which discusses the methodology of um, uh, the field study, and that was one of the, the major changes uh, as outlined in the memo on the agenda. Um, another change was uh, there was a, a, a pretty gross error, um, a, a omission of um, reference to the Pachamama's development at, at 8th and New Hampshire um, in, in uh, the study section of the report, so that was corrected. Um, uh, Stephen Watts mentioned that um, there were three uh, residential properties, not two, um, as the, the draft of the report uh, included or stated. Uh, and those properties have um, uh, uh, parking, parking uh, permits, zones in front, of, in front of their houses that are uh, established by ordinance. Um, so those were the, if, if I remember, those are the three major changes that we made. To so there's the more report. corrections rather Those were more than corrections um, yeah. and further explanation. Uh, the actual 30 recommendations that formed the plan uh, we felt that those, you know, from what we heard, uh, that those did reflect uh, the commission's desires for the final report. So those so are, those are consistent. Same. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. that's what I was going to walk through tonight is kind of focusing on, on those uh, those thirty recommendations. Um, I think I have it narrowed to down to eight slides, so I won't take too much time. But I want to want to get into it a little bit more. So this this slide just gives kind of the project overview. Um, kind of how we got to this point. Uh, I do want to emphasize that the recommendations are intended to be taken uh, comprehensively, or they're, they're at least developed comprehensively. Um, and I'll try to, try to draw links as I go through the different recommendations um, in my presentation, but you know, an, an example of the comprehensive nature of it um, is, uh, uh, in for, for example, um, license plate reading enforcement uh, technology is recommended. Um, that's going to be critical to uh, creating the, the types of efficiencies um, that will be needed to expand parking enforcement services uh, into, um, into the evening in downtown um, and also into the evening uh, and into the neighborhoods um, uh, in, in residential parking zones. Um, and, and so uh, that, that's an example of you know, one recommendation that, that really supports and builds on the city's ability to um, implement a series of recommendations after that. Um, another, another example of the connectivity of some of these recommendations is uh, a, a major theme and goal of this, um, of this plan is financial sustainability of the parking fund and the parking operations. Um, there are a number of recommendations, as I'm sure that you've all heard, um, 
uh, that, that, that address fee increases and fine increases. Um, one of the goals of the study is to, uh, is to mitigate or, or actually to reduce the number of citations that we issue. Um, uh, the parking fund uh, includes a number of different revenue items, but parking citations is a significant um, uh, revenue source in the parking fund. Um, and so fee increases are going to be offset um, to some extent, not fully offset we hope, but to some extent um, by reductions, uh, corresponding reductions in uh, parking citations and parking fines. Um, so that's, that's you know, just an example of some of the connectivity of, of these recommendations. Um, I like to, no to note, as with any strategic plan uh, that, that you would consider, be it a, a parking plan or um, any other uh, operational type plan, uh, the recommendations or approval of the plan does not bind the city um, to implement any or all of the rec recommendations. Um, it doesn't bind uh, the city to implement the recommendations exactly as they're described. Um, for example, uh, uh, one of the recommendations focuses on uh, metering technology. Uh, that, is, that is an industry that's evolving almost as we speak. I get calls probably once a week from different companies because they read their industry news and they see that we're doing a parking study here in Lawrence. Um, and everybody's offering a different type of uh, system, a different type of um, uh, contractual arrangement. Um, so, so that's something that we'll need to evaluate when we're ready and when we reach that point um, in, the, in the implementation. Uh, this uh, approval of the study does not um, prevent the city from implementing alternatives, uh, alternatives to the recommendations um, or course correction. Uh, this is not a, a stone tablet, so we can, we can change it as we go um, in order to, uh, to adapt to unanticipated um, consequences or, or effects. Um, and then finally, uh, as with any strategic plan, changes and recommendations will be made within the context of the public interest, of the budget, and of um, those users, those consumers of parking services who are going to be directly impacted. So, yes, sir. So, Brandon, the recommendations that come from the study itself, those items will come back either individually or in, in bunches come before the commission for final adoption? Some of them will, yes. Um, some more significant recommendations, especially um, investment in, in, in technology, um, you know, that's going to be a CIP item, for example. Um, there are going to be some ordinance, uh, ordinances that would be required, for example, a boot and tow ordinance, or um, probably a, a parking, a, a residential um, permit zone ordinance um, that establishes that program. So there will be numerous decision points for the City Commission as we go through the next several years of implementing this plan. Without breaking up your, discuss, your uh, uh, yeah, comments, yeah. Um, uh, what, give me an example of, of an item that would not come back uh, to the Commission for uh, approval. Um, for example, uh, changes in the, in the time limits on parking meters. Um, so, uh, in, you know, we, we, we could bring that back, but I would, I would suggest that that would be an administrative, uh, an administrative decision um, and we would implement, implement that at the administrative level. Um, we have, uh, for example, um, one of the recommendations is to convert uh, to, uh, I think, a, a, a certain number of two hour and all of the five hour meters to a 10 meter or 10 hour limit. Um, I don't believe that that's a decision that necessarily, I, I think you would address that policy issue tonight with approval of, of the plan. And feel free, anybody, to jump in and ask questions as we go. Um, Just real quick, so we're not, none of this approval tonight has to do with um, approving ordinances that correct. sample ordinances right. that were provided. Okay. Right, yeah, the, there are sample ordinances that the consultants uh, provided. I asked them to provide those, um, and they went above and beyond. And uh, you'll notice in, like, the, the uh, residential permit zone ordinance, um, they, they drew from numerous other communities' ordinances. Um, so we would, we would probably take uh, pieces of that, tailor it to our own situation, uh, and then bring it back to you for adoption before we would implement that program. So there'd be plenty of opportunity for public input on those ordinances, Correct. is that right? Okay. Yes, yes. And the plan also, um, a, a discussion that Commissioner Larson and I had um, previously, the plan does not recommend any specific streets, um, any specific blocks, any specific neighborhoods uh, f that would be included in a, in a permit zone. 
Um, rather, it, the consultants conducted a field study um, for the purpose of, of really identifying um, what, the, what the community is experiencing and whether or not a residential uh, permit zone type system would be appropriate for this community and, and their finding is that, is that it would be appropriate. I would think ideally um, that program would be, uh, would not be limited to this, the scope of the, the study area. Um, we had to limit that scope geographically um, just you know, for the, the logistical purposes of being able to complete a study. Um, but I think that that's a program that would, uh, that the commission will want to consider um, offering to all neighborhoods across the community. Uh, so th these are just some of the, the high-level objectives and priorities um, that the plan addresses. Uh, improved service delivery, uh, a lot of that is going to be um, going to be done through implementation of technology uh, and customer uh, service uh, customer service improvements. Um, we want to uh, we want to Im improve our internal coordination, our internal structure, um, so that we can be more responsive so that we can be more e effective and efficient in the management of our parking operations. Um, that, that was one of the, I think, one of the key findings, one of the key themes um, throughout this process was that the city is not really positioned um, to be able to be uh, a, a, as responsive as the citizens or the business operators would like us to be uh, when parking issues do come up. And that's where we get into issues where, you know, Three, uh, three property owners, uh, three residential properties have their own parking solutions, their own individual parking solutions, um, because the city, uh, the city staff is not able to be as responsive as we, as we would like to be or we need to be to address those issues. Um, we, again, we wanted to prioritize financial sustainability of the parking system, um, prioritize the reduction of uh, citations, um, and we would do that through increased um, compliance. People want to pay at the meter. A lot of times they don't have the quarter or the nickel or the dime to plug the meter, um, and, and they end up getting the $5 ticket. In fact, that actually happened to our consultants today. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, so we, <laughs> good, good contract management, we get a little bit back. Um, <laughs> And so, uh, and then finally, obviously the, the, the thing that really precipitated this whole study is the conflict. Um, so that was, that was a key uh, effort throughout this, this process was to identify um, recommendations and plans that would address and mitigate conflict between um, various consumer groups. Uh, so, so the plan, we really, we really did two studies and two plans. Um, at the same time, we got kind of a two for one uh, with this project. Uh, we focused on neighborhoods and we focused on downtown. Um, uh, so I'll start with neighborhoods first. Um, and, and really the neighborhood situation I think is, is much um, simpler in terms of the, the list of recommendations. Part of the reason is because we don't do neighborhood parking. We don't have a neighborhood parking program. We don't have neighborhood permits. We don't have an enforcement system. Um, and so there's a lot of low hanging fruit there. And we need to, I think, probably walk before we run. Um, although I, I would say, as I've traveled to other communities, um, I was out in Boulder uh, last month, actually, and uh, noticed that they had, um, I don't know, probably a dozen neighborhood uh, permit zones. And it's not a very complex um, type of program, but it's very effective and it's very important to those neighborhoods. Um, so, uh, so back to the, the, the recommendations. Um, the objective was to, to mitigate the conflicts, and those are the, the primary conflicts, um, as we see in the neighborhoods surrounding KU, um, is between the, the residents and, be, and um, the, the influx of students and faculty and staff that come into their neighborhoods every day, um, nine months out of the year. Uh, and that's that, as the consultants found in their field study, that's an intense um, burden that's placed on those people living there. On, and it's on all the neighborhoods, although the, f the field study and the, and the results of that focused, um, kind of narrowed it down to focus more specifically um, on the, the relatively most intense parts of, of uh, those conflicts. Um, the other uh, area that, that we found quite a bit of conflict was between downtown and East Lawrence neighborhood. Um, and, and primarily on, along the Rhode Island corridor. Um, Rhode Island is, um, I think, virtually uh, at 100% capacity um, almost all day, every day. 
if not all day, every day. Um, and there, there are numerous reasons for that, um, stretching clear down to uh, the Douglas County operation, um, and, then, and then clear down here to this end of the city, uh, or of the downtown. Um, so that was, that was a goal, was to mitigate those conflicts between users. Um, the, the recommendations, as I said, um, are to establish the permit zones within neighborhoods. And so that what that would look like is a petition-driven process um, where a, a group of, of neighbors on a street or multiple streets would, would come together and petition the city uh, to evaluate their, their zone and, uh, and develop a permit um, appropriate to their zone. Um, the zones would need to be sized sufficiently to address the, the problems uh, without creating spillover problems, without just migrating the problem to, um, to a, a neighboring street. Um, but we would not, uh, I, I think this, the study can be interpreted as, um, as it, it's based on neighborhood associations because we, we had that map that um, highlighted the neighborhood associations within the study area. That's not, that's not the purpose or the, the point here. Uh, the point would be that, um, that we would address uh, more localized uh, parking issues. Um, if a whole neighborhood association wanted to band together, then they could do that, but uh, sometimes that can be tricky and, and really uh, wouldn't even get to the heart of the issue. Um, Are those typically enforced? I mean, I, mean I, I don't know if you had an opportunity to see that in Boulder when you were there, but if, yeah. if, if we took, let's take the example of Rhode Island mm -hmm. Street where there's a, a great deal of traffic. If we were to institute a neighborhood parking permit for um, we'll just call it the Rhode Island district, yeah. and it was just the entirety of Rhode Island. Um, would that be police that would actually be enforcing it? Would it be downtown parking? Right, it would be our parking control officers. Um, and that goes back to, to uh, the license plate system. Okay. Um, and we would need to develop a, uh, a, a registration system um, where, where folks can sign up um, and, and register their license, you know, by license plate number um, and, you know, and make payments. Um, I, 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 so, so they would go, you know, the, the user would go through that system, go through that process, um, and then we would, we would use a license plate reading system. Um, we wouldn't be able to send somebody, you know, on foot to be able to cover that, right. that type, that level of territory. So we'd have to use that, um, that, that LPR system. So it would be the parking enf enforcement staff. Okay. And uh, I think internally, um, we would be able to develop um, that that work group um, to administer that program, um, so that you know if, if somebody it, it would be more public facing operations, so that if somebody wanted to petition for a, a, a permit zone, similar to uh, you know how the function that David Woosley and the Traffic Safety Commission used to used to play, um, our I think our parking enforcement staff would be able to play that role. And so they could go to somebody, they could consult with them and work on the development of a proper zone. Okay. So that was, that was really it for, um, for the neighborhood uh, recommendations. Are there any other questions before we move on to the, the downtown recommendations? So um, there were a number of object, ob objectives um, when developing the recommendations for downtown. One was to maximize the existing assets and avoid construction of new parking facilities. This gets to financial sustainability. Um, there, are, there are very simple and, and you know, at, it, improvements that can be made at a fairly not nominal cost, um, such as wayfinding um, and, and signage, uh, restriping of some existing lots, um, and we would need to do that consistent with, uh, with the city code provisions. Um, but, but we can gain a number of um, additional parking spaces simply by restriping. Um, we, we really had a commitment, we wanted to make a commitment to financial sustainability in this plan and run the parking system as an enterprise fund. Uh, as we shared last time and as the report points out, um, I don't know if it's, if it's I, I don't think it's practical to believe that we'll ever be able to pull, to pay the full debt service on our parking facilities, on the, on the parking garages. Through, um, through the parking f fund, but we want to move in that direction. Um, but that, that, is a, that is a big load, and I don't think the fees, the fee increases would be, uh, would be appropriate for that. So did you have a question? Yeah. Um, one aspect of this financial performance that's puzzling me is the relationship between the police security patrol yes. and the enterprise fund. 
Yeah. I'm not aware there's any link other than that's how we pay for some of our police force. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. And we, we looked into that um, after the last meeting. Um, so, so we were trying to find the history of that decision and it dates clear back to um, 2000. So there's not a lot of folks around who were, were here for that decision. Right. Um, we, uh, what, what we learned was that um, we, we believe there was a COPS grant that funded uh, those three positions. And when that grant expired, the decision was made to put those positions in the, uh, the parking fund as opposed to raising the mill levy in the general fund to, to pay for those positions. Mm -hmm. um, I found in, in my research um, at least one other position that is in the general fund that I believe should be paid out of the parking fund. So there is some potential to switch, to do some kind of one-for-one -one switching. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's... I think if we're serious about tracking this as an enterprise fund, we need to try to just keep things that are actually... You know, right. and if there's a reason to pay for the police security patrol out of this, then then that's another thing. Right. Um, in in the downtown master planning project, I think could be an opportunity to discuss that further. Um, you know, yeah. what is the role for potentially a downtown beat? Um, I think that there there could be some need there, but but I, I agree, and that's something that we should work towards um, as we as we implement this plan. Thank you. Um, I, I did want to emphasize, uh, you know, the operational efficiency that we would get through through the staff or through the technology investments and the um, some of the changes to the staffing structure, um, and and that's going to be I think very important uh, for our staff. I think we've got, you know, our consultants will tell you we've got incredible parking enforcement officers and they've got great ideas for how to do their job, um, and and that doesn't mean how to write more tickets. It means how to avoid writing more tickets and how to, how to be more customer friendly, customer oriented. Um, so we want to empower them and we want to empower them to also be uh, problem solvers as well. Um, and then finally, uh, on, on this theme, um, we do want to move towards a TDM, a transportation demand management model um, that integrates, uh, you know, in intermodal concepts, um, you know, there's no reason why our parking our parking managers can't also um, work on downtown bicycle parking, for example. Um, why we can't, why they can't lead the effort to work on um, incentives uh, um, such as um, like, a, like a pre tax incentive um, on everybody's paycheck uh, to be able to invest in a bus pass or in a bicycle. Um, so there, there are a number of different types of solutions that, um, that, that we would like to, to work towards. Um, and ultimately, um, I think integration of, uh, of our um, public transit system into, into you know, downtown parking and just you know, completely, well not completely, but in encouraging folks to keep their cars at home, carpool, ride a bus, ride a bike to come downtown. Um, th that's going to be critical in, in the long term to avoiding that next parking garage. So. Brandon, that's that's a great idea, but we're still going to have a number of people that's going to bring yep. their cars to come Absolutely. down. One of the things that, you know, I heard so much today from um, you know, some of my uh, neighbors in downtown, I mean, obviously, is striking that balance between, you know, the, the, uh, the, the public wanting to do business in downtown and, you know, businesses and, and, and just uh, making sure that we all understand. I appreciate the comment about, uh, you know, not having to raise large increases on fines or, right. you know, but periodically being able to do them, it probably makes some sense. But, you know, still, uh, you know, this has to be something that is, is, is kind of a business friendly thing also. Yes. And, and recognizes that because, you know, we've got public parking in downtown. Some of it, you know, uh, we're asked to pay for as property owners in downtown. Uh, and some we pay just through through our taxes along with the community at large. So got to be real careful on on, on just what those costs are going to be because right. you can shop anywhere you know for free. I guess in in some ways, I mean you're going to pay for it somehow in in the price of the goods and certain goods and services that you buy in outlying areas. But you know it's a it's still a balance. I know I've picked up a lot of tickets over time and. and I hope my wife didn't hear that, but um, <laughs> uh, but no, I mean it's something that you do as a downtown business owner. But just re I just want everybody to recognize that. Yes, and that and that's a very good point. Um, you know, I, I I hear the comments th through this process. I've heard it many times, and um, 
you know, I think the same thing sometimes too. You know, why would I go downtown and pay a meter when I can go out to 31st in Iowa and not have to pay for parking? Um, you know, something that I that that I think uh, needs to be stated, at, at, as you did state it, is that when you go downtown, you park in the public parking system. These are public assets; they're owned by the public, and there is a significant cost um, to to the pavement and the concrete um, and, and the technology that goes into the public parking system. Um, and so, you know, if, if you do go out to um, to the outlying areas to go do your shopping or to to eat dinner, um, that is that's private property. Those are private lots. Um, and I would think that you know if, if I'm running a business um, at, at one of those locations, then the cost of developing that parking lot and maintaining that parking lot is probably going to be factored into into the pricing of the goods and services that I offer. Um, so you know we we as the city, as is any city with the public parking system, we're faced with the the difficult decisions about charging. Um, to be able to actually provide that parking, so it's it, it puts you all in a tough position, but that's that's part of the job, unfortunately. So. Well, I guess my understanding is is that the main reason to to charge is so that we have turnover for the businesses downtown. Is that that's a that's accurate? a key that's a key piece. So of I mean, it we're well. we're really kind of doing it for the businesses down there. Correct. Anyway, yeah, so. to keep turnover, to make sure, right. and to also make sure that there's sufficient parking. Right. Um, it you know it's it. You can't, you can't have just one piece alone. Um, you know, we, we do have to have sufficient parking inventory. We have to have sufficient enforcement um, to keep turnover going, especially in those premium spots, you know, in, in the, the storefront spots on, on Mass Street. Um, and so, you know, those, those issues all, all kind of play on each other. So. Um, so, so as we were talking about, another objective was to improve the customer experience in the downtown. Uh, when it comes to parking, um, one thing that I that I mentioned earlier was meter time limit increases um, or, or changes, I guess conversions, um, to really a, I guess more accurately reflect what the demand is and what the utilization is. Um, this is especially in the New Hampshire corridor where we're seeing um, lots of lots of infill redevelopment, um, and so uh, I I think I counted 98. Uh, 98 conversions to 10 hour meters. The 10 hour meter is the most popular and the most highly utilized meter in the downtown. Um, I, I think about 70 of those will be in the, I think six, seven and 800 block of New Hampshire. Um, so, so that would create a significant uh, number of parking spaces that I think our professional services, uh, businesses and employees uh, tend to use a lot more. They really need those. Um, and, and then in addition to that, um, and, and I'll get into this probably, I think, in the next slide. Uh, we need to move resident, residential parkers um, out, of, out of that corridor and move them um, where, where we mitigate that conflict between the professional services, the customers, and the businesses, and, and move them um, to a place where they can, they can park and at 8 a.m. or 7.30 a.m. when business operators are coming into the downtown, they've got a place to park. Um, so that so we we address that and, and I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that with the next slide um, the ability to pay that, that was another theme throughout this study uh, um, so so a, 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 a approval of a plan would set us on a path where we are um, in the in the near future making investments in technology so that you can pay by your smartphone you can pay by your credit card um, in some cases I think some technology uh, you can you can um, you can actually go ahead and order parking uh, for others. You can order parking on your way um, to downtown. So it would, it would I think, dramatically increase um, the level of customer service and the customer experience in the downtown. Um, okay, and so finally, addressing the downtown parking conflicts. Um, so th the conflicts are numerous, um, but the, the real issue that we heard about um, in the public process was the the threat of um, residential uh, parking consumers um, on on the existing businesses and the existing customer base in the downtown, um, and and so a lot of the recommendations uh, that you do see in in the in the plan um, are aimed at addressing that particular issue, and particularly along the New Hampshire corridor. 
Um, so uh, I, I think it would be better for our consultants to speak more at length about that, but um, I, I did want to just emphasize that because that was, that was a key um, component in, in development of this, this plan. Um, the plan uh, would have us working with Douglas County uh, to address lot, lot, the LEC parking. That's a city operated lot, a city owned lot, um, and it's, it's completely maxed out. It's been maxed out for a long time. Um, and a lot of that parking ends up spilling over into Rhode Island, onto New Hampshire, um, in places that create more conflict in, in downtown. Um, I, the plan would have us increasing the cost of meter bags. Right now, uh, for $1, um, a, an applicant can, can get a meter bag, um, I think virtually into perpetuity. Um, and so uh, we have construction projects, we have uh, downtown events, um, and, and we like those in downtown, but it creates a, uh, it, it, it creates a burden on the parking system, and that displaces parkers. Um, in some cases for a significant amount of time, and in every case at, as it is currently for a nominal cost. Um, so we need to address that. Um, uh, the, the plan would have us addressing multiple and habitual violators um, through a, a system of pro progressive fines um, and also through a boot and tow ordinance. Again, those would be decision points that would be coming back to the city commission in the future. Is Marilyn um, going to find out about that? Never. Never. <laughs> uh, and then, and then finally, the extended hours of operation. Um, you know, I, I read in the paper this morning uh, about about that particular recommendation, and I felt like there was kind of a an angle um, to that article uh, that that pitched it as a kind of a cash grab, um, a way to generate more revenue. Um, I don't think that that's that's the the objective. That's not the purpose of this. Um, there is a lot of activity in downtown in the evenings, which is, which is awesome. It's great to see. Um, there's as many people going into downtown that I see from my office at 5 o'clock as there are going out, if not more going in. Um, we also have, like I said, a lot of res residential units going into downtown. And then we have a lot of professional services. Um, you know, the barbershop's open at, what, 6? 6 a.m. Uh, yeah, it's, it's too early, <laughs> and and so you know employees, employees and professional you know professional service companies are open and shop early in the morning, and in some cases, particularly along the New Hampshire corridor, they don't have parking at 8 a.m. And so that that is a that is an issue, and the way to get at that is to be able to enforce um, things like a residential downtown parking permit into the evening when folks are coming back home. Um, if you know if they're parking where the professional services groups or the uh, the you know the breakfast employees are going to have to park in the morning, then that's a conflict, and, and this is how we get at that. Uh, extended hours also supports uh, residential uh, permit zone enforcement. Um, again, folks are coming home in the evening, and if they don't have a place to park because there are there are people parking in their um, residential permit zone who are not permitted to park in there or do not have a guest pass, then we'll need to be able to enforce that. Um, so that's going to be a service level expectation. So that's, that's the end. I've walked you pretty much through all 30 of the recommendations. Uh, I'm sorry for taking so long, but I thought it would be good for us to just go through all of them. Are there any more questions? One thing, um, when you were saying earlier there might be some things that could be administratively approve that kind of made me a little uncomfortable because I think that we need to have some better conversation for the items you know because there's so many items it's not possible for us to talk about all of them in depth Tuesday night right now so I think it would be good if we talked about those as they come along individually and right. just kind of I mean we need to have a good decision about it but also good education <clears throat> about what right. we're doing right. so I think that would be Mayor. really helpful Mayor, one suggestion along with exactly what you said and mm -hmm. I, I wrote down, you know, the use of the right-of-way pretty much rests with the governing body, correct? We're the ones that pretty much make all the decisions on what happens on the right-of-way? Well, for, um, are, are you speaking about right-of-way permitting? Like, like, items, like a street items closure? Items of the right-of-way, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, anything yeah. like that. So like in, in the downtown, like a street closure event, for example, um, a lot of those decisions we're making administratively now, okay. um, because it was it was clogging up your agenda. You were making decisions about the Christmas parade every year, <laughs> and you know we the the assumption was the Christmas parade is an accepted event in, the, in this town, and so we would 
we wouldn't we wouldn't raise that to the level of the, the commission agenda. We do um, what is it, Chuck? Sixty five or something uh, street closure events in the downtown every year, and so that's sixty five decisions that you would have to make throughout the year, um, where applicants would have to come and and. Um, in some cases, if their if their item was pulled off the consent agenda, then they would have to present on that. Um, so we are moving a lot of those decisions to the administrative level. Um, there's an efficiency gain in doing that. Um, and, and I would say, um, you know, we, we do need to empower the staff to be able to um, to to try to solve problems. And so if there's something that they can do, you know, if they have a business that says, you know, I know that if you change, you know, these this set of meters uh, to five hours or what you know x x amount of time then that's going to solve the problem this localized problem and so I would like to be able to, to empower the staff to be able to experiment and conduct a little pilot project um, and evaluate the results of that um, I, I think that that's you know we, we have people who are literally making life and death decisions in the field every day um, and so I think that um, the parking doesn't rise to that level, but in, in a lot of cases it, it will rise to the policy level. So we'll keep you abreast as we as we get to decision points. So if there's, if there's things that are in this plan that we, we just don't want done, should we give you that direction? Then? Right. Yeah. I, I think we should have that conversation. Yeah. yeah we That's why that I think it would be better to talk about them individually when those decision points come instead of trying to you know, decide everything that we feel like, because I kind of feel like I would rushed if I have to do everything tonight. You know, there's no way that's possible to have good public comment. And well, I know there's going to be some things that you like in this and mm -hmm. things, some things you don't, same, same with me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that if there's things that a majority of the commission, you know, either don't want done or, or you know, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. um, you know, that somewhere along the line we need to be directing staff on, on what's in this plan and what's mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. so, so I think what we could do um, is, is work up more comp like a comprehensive package of, um, of changes. And, and so instead of making, um, you know, we'd make, for example, all of the meter time limit changes at once. We'd make all of the fee changes at once and the fine changes at once, um, as opposed to bringing all 30 of, of the decision points back to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a package, you know, of the low hanging fruit kind of thing first, right. you know, and then move your way up the ladder. But yeah, even if it is just a package that we approve by city commission, like I said, I think it helps for public education as well when it comes to us to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As part of that process, Mayor, do you think that we would have the opportunity then to select from those recommendations as mm -hmm. to what we want to do and what we don't want to do, or well, have the staff do? I think that's that would be the time that we talked about it. That's is when, when that it package is. would come. Okay. Right. I guess one of the things that is interesting to me is that the idea is that this is a comprehensive plan and there's this interdependency on a lot of these items that I'm picking up from Brandon is kind of required. Um, I think that might be one of those things that we have to get an understanding of as well. Um, I'm a little concerned about going in and, you know, kind of cherry picking this and cherry picking that. Um, but I got to admit, there are a couple of things that I got a little concerned about when I, when I saw the recommendations. So I think what I'd like to do is just ask Brandon, you know, how can, um, how can we understand the interdependency of these things um, as we try to make these policy decisions? I think when he brings up the package idea that he brings things to us as packages, not all 30 at once, but if there are five that are interrelated, that would come to us as a package. That's how I understood you to be right. saying that, Brandon. Right. Yeah. Um, you know what? A, a lot of these recommendations, we, we can package together and bring them all at once. I, I've got no, no concerns about that. Um, but I, I, I think one of the keys is going to be, as Commissioner Bully said, or Vice Mayor Bully said, was, was 
um, we, we don't want to get into a situation where we, we make a big investment and then we don't back it up with, with the revenue, for example, that we would need to fund it. And then we have to subsidize that investment with, with tax dollars. Sure. Um, so that's, you know, th those are the, I, that would be my number one concern, but we can address that as, as those decision points come up. Mm -hmm. And a, as with anything, you know, we'll be consulting with the city manager um, and the, sit, the city attorney, uh, and the mayor and the vice mayor as, you know, as um, the agendas are, are prepared. And, um, you know, we have that discussion, uh, you know, relatively often, you know, when are we getting into policy? Because <laughs> that's not yeah. the role of the staff. I guess that one question I have does touch on one of the recommendations, if we can do that. Um, the first one is eliminate the designation of on-street parking spaces for use only by the residents of one particular property. Is that something that can be administratively done, or is that, a, is that a, something that we would have to address? No, sir, those are ordinances, so they would okay. be required uh, to, to be uh, amended by the city commission. Um, and, and we had some discussion about that back in June at, at the June 6th meeting, um, and uh, I believe Mr. Watts requested that uh, those would be, at least his would be sunsetted um, after he, you know, his property is no longer um, under his ownership. I think that's a perfectly sensible um, okay. request. Right. So, thank you. Okay, any other questions? comment along those lines as long as we're going to be able to have those discussions at some time and like that piece of you know, you know that request is I don't know seven eight nine years old it seems like and we've actually approved it I think what twice now or extended it a second time I think it is yeah, I think and, we have in the past you know that's it here again that kind of goes back to what I was talking about a little bit ago with uh, uh, you know the um, uh, commission you know making decisions on the right of way and, and now staff doing some of those things right. just to make make sure it, at least by that ordinance that is an agreement as I see it between the governing body and a resident to make sure that you know that there is adequate parking you know for for at least that property because there, there's a, like the end of the world Correct. right there I, I mean there's just nowhere to go and I, I just don't see a need to go back and redo something that we've already done there correct yeah anyway okay. right my feeling on that one so if we lump like excuse me if, mm -hmm. if we lump like five of these things ten of these things whatever however you're going to do it we're going to have the time I just want to make sure of this we're going to have the time or the governing body is going to have the time probably be without me but uh, <laughs> it's going to have the time to be able to discuss these items and, and be able to have the input on those right right. Mm -hmm. right it would it would take us a number of years you know we pitched this as a 10-year plan um, it, it could take us all of 10 years I would hope it doesn't but um, we wanted to be conservative in that estimate. Plus, we like round numbers, so uh, um, I, I would I would think it, it's going to take at, at minimum five years to get through all of this work. So, okay, and there'll be room for public input on the way along the way. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I think um, will be a huge decision for this community is is the conversion of the metering technology. Um, uh, I, I think we would want to, at minimum, engage our uh, downtown businesses and probably some a representative group of um, customers, uh, you know, patrons to those businesses. Uh, we'd want to make sure that we address all sorts of issues, um, everything from uh, accessibility, uh, generational issues, um, you know, technology gaps. Uh, we, you know, if we go to a pay by phone system, we want to make sure that we're not, you know, that 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 everybody who visits the downtown has a place to park and, and can pay for that parking in some form. So, although we will still have, maintain a, a, a whole lot of free spaces, so. Okay, well, let's go to public comment. Thank you, Brandon. All right, do we got public comment on this item? Come on up and sign in and tell us what you think. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Ken Easthouse, 1611 East 24th Street. Um, I wanted to pass along some of the analysis that I did on my own uh, in reviewing some of the uh, proposals, particularly some of the data that they used to draw some of their conclusions. Um, specifically, I want to look at their analysis of the peak periods that they used. Um, they conducted two days of studies, uh, one on Wednesday, December 14th, and one on Wednesday, January 25th. Um, just for some context, on Wednesday, 
20, on Wednesday, December 14th, it was 27 degrees outside, and they took uh, surveys between 10 and 11 a.m. and between 1 and 2 p.m. They duplicated that those same time frames on Wednesday, January 25th. Now, the explanation that they gave uh, on page 13 of the report, uh, particularly for December, is December parking demands tend to be significantly higher than typical parking period demands in vibrant downtowns. Uh, there was no context related to that particular statement. I would argue, since our downtown has a smaller mix of retail and a higher mix of restaurant, arts and entertainment, bars, things of that nature, that December might not be when our peak period is. Uh, from personal experience, I can tell you that usually the springtime and, so, and the weekends are going to be a higher peak period use for our parking downtown. So I guess part of me is concerned that many of these conclusions were drawn when we don't have an accurate representation of when our actual peak period use is. Um, uh, like I said, our downtown really is integrated in an in a interesting sort of way. Um, because we have lower retail development, I think a lot of general assumptions can, that uh, may be used in other parking studies may not necessarily apply to us. And I wanted to know uh, opinions on that. And then finally, uh, the study doesn't necessarily take into account, and I don't know if, if they necessarily specialize in this, is any sort of sales tax reductions based on decreased use of downtown because of increased fees for downtown. I know that's a concern of mine. Uh, if I'm penalized more for going downtown in terms of increased fees or increased fines, uh, I may just shop elsewhere. And I know that not everyone uh, disagrees. So thank you. Thank you, Ken. Frank Jansen, 38 New Hampshire. You got my address on file there. Some years ago I was in Kansas City, Missouri and parked in a, a zone that was, I didn't realize was a uh, uh, rush hour zone and I had to pay a $35 ticket. I'm curious about why this thing may take a long time is uh, license plate reading, I uh, don't know how that works, that must, must be done elsewhere. What if it comes up with a stolen vehicle? Uh, enforcing cars parked in the residential area, if you have these uh, special permits for people like on Rhode Island Street and you find a car that doesn't have that permit, what does enforcing mean? Does it mean you're going to tow the car away or what? Uh, final Fridays, if you have a 9, 9 p.m. Uh, time on the meters, you might, might, might change it on Final Friday. Uh, when I called the number, because uh, for Pachamama's apartment complex, it's 800 lofts on the internet. The number you call is first management. And when I got him on the phone, I said, what about parking? He said, oh yeah, get a parking permit from the city. So I called the city and the parking permits are uh, sold at $50 for three months or $200 for a year. Uh, and those parking permits allow you to park in any 10 hour lot, 10 hour parking slot, which if you're gonna expand those in the area, you can do that. Over behind the Hobbs Taylor Loft are some signs in the parking lot that say city parking permit only, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., which kind of makes me wonder uh, how they can do that and what does that mean with people who are going to be parking there and as Brandon was talking about, people who work and then come home versus those who don't. I can see how it's very complicated and I can see how it's going to take a long time for you guys to discuss all these details. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Any other public comment? Uh, Dan Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Um, just a couple comments. Uh, one, uh, there used to be parking for downtown employees at the top of the garage at 9th and New Hampshire, I believe. And that parking space was captured by the uh, developer for the hotel on the other side, I believe. I may be mistaken. I would suggest trying to recapture that space for downtown employees. Number two, there is a place on between Kentucky 
in Tennessee on the south side of 8th Street. And there are two cars with two trailers attached that have parked there forever, forever being a, a year or more. And I asked a police officer, I said, what's, what's happening here? And he said, well, there's a loophole in the city ordinance. All they have to do is move their cars and their trailers about a foot and uh, we can't do anything. So these individuals have deprived other people of parking, particularly people who maybe want to use a swimming pool, can't park there because these two trailers and these two cars are parking for free. I mean, a, you can't beat it. It's a good deal. But we don't have any authority to say, okay, move your cars and your trailers someplace else. So I think that needs to be taken care of. The other thing is motorcycles. Motorcycles are infesting this town like you wouldn't believe. It's like having motorized bed bugs all over the place. And particularly on Massachusetts Street, you will see one motorcycle in a parking slot and it's just one motorcycle. I suggest designating a parking lot someplace, we could probably find one, for motorcycles only. And they would park there. And it would maybe uh, disabuse them of the notion that somebody wants to hear their loud racket going down Massachusetts and see their all tricked out machine. Um, I would rather have my ears not being assaulted every time by these motorcycles. And I think part of that could be cured if we had a party, parking lot designated uh, for, for motorcycles. One other point, I live on University Drive west of Crestline. Well, there's no parking problem there. Well, there is. There's a bus stop at the corner of University and Crestline. So KU students, they are cunning little wildlife, these creatures. They have learned that they can park on University Drive, walk over to the bus, and go on to campus. And they don't have to pay anything. I thought the university had a circulator from one of their parking lots south of the bioscience uh, complex that went up to campus. But evidently you have to pay something for that. And so uh, uh, KU students, they know how to save a dime. So they're going to uh, park on University Drive. It hasn't happened a lot, but it's just a matter of time before more of them become uh, aware of the situation. Thank you, Dan. Any other public comment? Come on up. Good evening, my name is John Brewer. I live at 1109 Ohio, and I'm the other person like Steve Watt that has permit parking. We've had it for two or three years. It's worked extremely well. And uh, I'm hoping that, uh, that we can be sunsetted with the permit we have. I looked at the uh, plan for the uh, neighborhood parking and concluded that it would basically, if, if our parking permit were erased, it would put us back in the situation we had before because we could not be assured of having a parking spot in front of our house, which is what, what we wanted before and what we have now. The other thing uh, when we talked about this at the Oriad Neighborhood Association would be that if a three block area were established beyond where we are, uh, that it might actually serve as a um, a distance and need for people to use that and come back and fill up our street more just because they knew it was not controlled by the permit zone. At any rate, it, I just want to be here to personally request a sunset coverage for our permit because we would really like to hold on to it if we can. Thanks. Thank you, John. Any other public comment? Okay, so back to the commission. 
We've got a few questions here, Brandon, wherever Brandon went. There you are. <laughs> All right, we'll try to find these. So the peak periods, um, the analysis didn't include weekends. Is, is this something that's going to occur in the future or more analysis, more data gathering, I guess I should say? Yeah, yeah. If, if, if we get a license plate and reading enforcement system, um, we'll have the ability to take these counts um, any, any time. Uh, and, and we already perform, uh, our parking enforcement staff performs periodic counts in the downtown areas. Um, it's, it's periodic, it's not, it's not, it's really just to kind of take the temperature, keep the temperature of, of the downtown, but um, we'll have, we'll have a lot of data to be able to see where the hot spots are um, and where we may need to make changes and, and recommend changes uh, to metering limits, you know, permitting requirements and that sort of thing, so. Yeah, uh, as someone that lived next to downtown, you know, 10 o'clock on weekdays was when you would go downtown and then you would avoid it like the plague, like Saturdays at two o'clock. Right. So I completely right. understand that. Yeah, that. And, and, and I will say about the, de the December count, um, I specifically uh, asked the consultants to perform that count because I wanted to test a theory of mine, which was that we do have an influx of holiday uh, shoppers um, or you know, holiday traffic and parkers. Um, obviously, that's going to be offset to to great extent by the um, the uh, students who who leave town for the holidays. Um, they found that that really there's there's not a holiday effect like I thought there was. So that was really. That was really because of me, so. Okay. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. I'm just going down through the questions. I had a question about, um, you had indicated earlier that you had hoped that this would be implemented within five years. Is that correct? Something? That's just my own, my own personal okay. desire, yeah. So we don't see it on the CIP anywhere. Is that something that can be expected in the future? Yeah. Yes, yes. We, we, we didn't want to make assumptions about any of the, you know, the technology investments without having uh, having your approval of the plan. So. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, another question, one that I've always personally been confused about as well, is behind Hobbs-Taylor, there are those spots. Do they have their own permits? Because they have spray paint on the spaces, if I remember right. That's a str is that private parking or public parking? No, it, it, is, it is a public lot. Um, right behind it to the... Scott, do you know? The it's, a, it's a mix of public. Okay. It is very odd. They're, they're, I never know where to park when I go over there. They're, they're, the, you have to follow the, the um, not all clear signs, not altogether clear signs in my opinion about them. We do our best to mark the spaces, but there are I think two rows of public parking right. and then some private parking there as, yeah. I, as I recall. Maybe some, just some better signage might be good because yeah. I mean, it is a little confusing. So I guess the point is you have to read the signs to, to understand what's public and what's not there yeah. and, what, and what the time uh, limit, I think they're 10 hour spaces. Yeah, they are 10 hour. Yeah. Okay, and then the next question had to do the top level of the garages on New Hampshire and I think the one by the library had that as well. Are those still free parking or what's going on? Those are free on? parking spaces. Okay, yes. so both, both garages have free parking on the top level. Yes. And there are, does the plan call for them staying that way? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Good. Okay, and of course, uh, discussions about the circulator buses with KU people wanting to park and then take the bus into KU, that will happen in the next five to 10 years <laughs> to better impact people using that system, right? Are we talking about KU and any of this plan, students parking? Well, that's, I mean, that's really at the heart of a lot of the residential parking okay. uh, issues that, that we heard of throughout this, this sure. uh, project. But this is for uh, people that purposely park and then go to the next bus stop so that they can just take the bus in. That's something I would totally do if I was a student. Yeah, I mean, Sorry. to me, it sounds like like this is a great cause to to you know, present a petition for a residential parking zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and um, I think that was all the actual questions. There was there was one other. Um, I, I think it was a, kind of a statement uh, that Mr. East House made that I that I just wanted to to provide a little context for, and that's that's the fees, um, so actual meter fees. Uh, in, 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 in my research, I found that since 1981, so in 36 years, uh, the cost to purchase 30 minutes of parking at a meter has increased 20 cents. The cost to purchase two hours of parking at a meter has increased 30 cents. 
and the cost to purchase uh, 10 hours at a parking meter has increased 55, uh, 75 cents. So that's, that, that has been the extent of the fee increases in the last 36 years. Um, uh, the, the fines have, have increased um, a little bit more, but it's gone um, since pre-1996, which I think that may date, I think that may date back to uh, the 80s. Um, it was $1 uh, for an overtime ticket, and then in 2016, uh, that, is, that is $5, uh, 2016 and beyond currently. So, so that's been kind of the extent of the increases we've had historically. Thank you. So. Any other questions? I had a question sure. on the, the, the proposal calls for, uh, let me find it here. Uh, item number 22, it calls for a uh, $100 ticket for repeat offenders. What, what were they operating with as their definition for a repeat offender? I mean, how many tickets do I have to get before it costs me $100? Come on up to the microphone. Thank you. Jerry Salzman. Um, our, our thought is that um, uh, we would suggest that if you have three unpaid tickets at any one moment, that qualifies you as a repeat offender. And if you look at the sort of the distribution of, you know, uh, multi-ticketed people, um, sort of three is sort of the, you know, you might, you could conceivably get three tickets in a short period of time. But beyond that, you're, it's, you're really a repeat offender. And, and if you talk to the enforcement people, they know exactly who those people are. And it's not three, really, it's actually they have a lot more, um, and um, but people don't feel that there's any real punishment, um, and so that's our theory. You know, there's nothing magic about three; it could be four, um, but somewhere in that vicinity is what you really want in order to get the behavior you want, which is people either to stop violating um, and pay their their normal you know meter fees. Um, or um, you know, uh, be punished significantly and say this is a you know it's not fair to everybody else. So on my fourth unpaid ticket, I get a hundred dollar ticket and my car towed. Yeah. So really, that becomes like a two hundred. Like five hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a big deal. That that is a really big deal. It's a big deal. But these are all just recommendations at this point. Absolutely. And, and it would come back to us before Absolutely. the thing was. Mr. Salzman, do you, do you have an idea of the population of what you would call the repeat offenders I, I based on your study? I don't have it with me. I think we got some information on it. We could get it for you. I know the staff okay. has it. Um, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's remarkable that so, some people are um, basically oblivious to the concept of paying meters. Now, we're guilty today uh, once. <laughs> um, because um, the truth is we didn't have any coins. Um, if your meters took uh, credit cards, we would have paid. Um, um, plus we wanted to test it. Um, <laughs> it I was gonna say, Eric Haggett from yeah. Desmond. Um, off the top of my head, I think the person that the court said that they have a top 50 list of repeat offenders that they go through periodically to mail out notices or pursue further when they have time. Um, but these are the people with many, many more than 10, a dozen tickets. So yeah. she mentioned 50. I don't know if that's an approximation or yeah. what they So we spend a lot of money sending these people stuff and ticketing their cars. Absolutely. And Correct. We're not the, getting that's much just, you know, the, the point of my question was that I want to make sure we have a pretty firm grasp of what repeat offender means because right. I, have a, I have less of a problem towing a car that has 50 unpaid tickets yeah. than I do to have towing one that has three. I mean, those are two fundamentally different people. I think it'd be interesting to get that information about the population tickets. Absolutely. Well, when that decision point comes to us for something like that, we'll have better data and public yeah. input as well. Sure hope so. Right. And, and one of the things that we were thinking about and typically is, 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 is done is when you implement a, a new policy like that, uh, you know, sort of a fairly harsh policy, um, that you uh, uh, provide for some sort of amnesty period to let people have a way to you know, pay up and get square with, with the city um, so that they're not subject to that. Um, and um, because now I don't think people feel any real penalty. Um, the, frankly, the, the fines are fairly low. 
Um, and um, I, th that's, I, I think, the sort of civilized way to approach things. If you're going to raise the bar on them, um, you give them a chance to, you know, to, 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 to settle up and then go from there. Thank you. All right, so that was the end of public comment. Did you all have any other questions for Brandon? So, yeah, Brandon, we have two phases of this, um, uh, of the recommendations. Um, are we going to jump around from phase one to phase two? How are these things going to come before the commission? Well, the, there could be um, some jumping around. <laughs> uh, the, yeah. they, they were developed um, in sort of sequential order uh, based on logistical needs. So obviously, you know, we're not going to be able, the staff's not going to be able to uh, enforce um, permit zones in, uh, in the neighborhood until we have the ordinance and until we have the efficiencies and the technology in place to do that um, so that people can pay and so that we can enforce. Um, so, so a lot of it is sequential um, and the recommendations were also developed based on feasibility um, and, and, and cost and so it's, it's kind of the plan is kind of backloaded. The implementation timeline is kind of backloaded. So those more difficult, more challenging issues are going to be in the phase two section. Good. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so our action tonight is to approve the City of Lawrence Parking System Operations and Development Plan. Mayor, I gotta, <clears throat> I gotta say one thing, I, and you know, um, Commissioner Herbert brought it up a second ago in, in talking about, you know, the three tickets, and mm -hmm. I'm really concerned about making downtown parking unfriendly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really am, and you know, I think that there's some ideas here that are, that are good, but you know, I, I, I really just believe that some of this stuff, uh, you know, you know, as, as long as it's coming back to the commission, the commission has final decision over, I think it's important. A uh, gentleman that got up and spoke about uh, uh, downtown on, uh, you know, the uh, study being done on December 15th. I, I tell you what, Christmas time, we have a parking problem. If we don't have a parking problem, we're going to have a real problem in downtown. You're going to be filling stores, but, uh, you know, uh, things like that, I, I think that, that we really we need to be aware of that. But I just, I, I have that concern. I, I really do. And, and, you know, you can convince me how, as, as this stuff comes back before us, you know that we are going to have that final say or the mm -hmm. governing body is you know okay that's fine but i think the way that this is written right now other than the the elimination of the uh, two areas of designated on street parking for the residential units 1109 the edge hill i mean i'm going to have a problem with this just because i think that there is some concern there about so about you want to see parking. written in there that these items will come to the city commission for final I think the city commission, approval the governing body has to have approval of these items is that something that we would put into the motion because i'm comfortable with that yeah i'm fine yeah there's there's a lot of i mean there's obviously 29 re 30 recommendations here and i I th I'm very excited about a lot of them i'll be perfectly honest with you the idea of making this an enterprise fund is is something I thought for a long time should have been you know I, I think it was two years ago I sat on this very body and the very first time I got a chance to work with the budget made the comment that we're losing money enforcing parking you know what what's the point of giving tickets if it's costing us money to give tickets but um, so I love the idea of going to the enterprise fund I absolutely love the idea of going to electronic uh, payment you know I talk to a lot of people that get tickets and they don't get tickets well what like yourself they don't they don't get tickets because they're specifically trying to dodge the system they get tickets because it's 2017 and nobody carries real money anymore and you know if I can use my MasterCard I'd, I'd have an updated meter all day but uh, and so I, I think the I, a lot of this is great in terms of moving us into the 21st century parking that's wonderful I like the idea of giving longer range parking ability to where we can actually have less tickets in theory. You know, if, if my two hour lot becomes a 10 hour lot, that's gonna be a lot more convenient as a downtown employee or as a longer term downtown shopper, stuff like that. What scares me about this um, is, is mixed into this whole moving us into the 21st century, moving us into an enterprise fund, are these sporadically placed, incredibly heavy handed, recommendations uh, this this boot and toe hundred dollar ticket on your third ticket 
for instance, uh, takes us to a level of, of, of punitive that uh, I, I think will drive people away. I'm not going to be driven away having to pay an extra 30 cents to park 10 hours. That's not going to drive me away. I'm not going to be driven away paying a $5 ticket instead of a $3 ticket. But having three tickets and having my car towed will, will quite literally drive me away. Uh, and so um, I, I think we have to be very careful in adopting these, that we look at them one at a time and we make sure that the purpose of it is actually to help us get into that enterprise state and, and also help us get into the 21st century, but, but that it doesn't lead to more downtown vacancy than we already have. Can I ask a question? Are you more concerned about the number three, or are you concerned about the boot and toe? Hmm. Because That's right a good now we, I'm, I'm a little concerned about both, but I'm, well, I'm particularly uh, upset about the number three. I guess, I guess when I when I when we talk about doing this as kind of a interdependent thing, we're still going to have the cost of issuing all those tickets if we don't have a, a method of real enforcement. Yeah. And what we're doing is not, I mean, we're not doing real enforcement now when we've got people with hundreds of tickets and it, it's not affecting them at all. So I guess my, my problem is I have more a problem with the number three than I do the boot and toe. Yeah, I'd but agree with I, that. I was just curious because you sounded concerned about, equally concerned about both. So. I, I just think, you know, the comment was made that right now people park illegally because there's no threat. And I, I agree with that. I, I completely, I mean, I, there's been times when I've just had to run in somewhere and you say, you know what, I'm going to risk it because worst case scenario, I'm out five bucks. And, you know, I get that. But I also think there's, there's almost an element of that that's okay. You know, that, that I don't think we're, we're making good policy if our policy is literally leaving people feeling threatened going downtown. That's not good policy. Uh, and and if, if what we do leaves the perception of, I feel threatened to go park downtown, we, we may have made a big mistake. Now, well, we're not making policy with this, approving this document, are we? We're just a, approving the document with the idea that part of it, pieces of it will come back to us. Yeah, no, so, I understand that. I'm just, okay. I want to, yeah, I want to get it out because it's, you know, this document is publicly available and I, I want to make sure we understand that. I think that the vast majority of this document is, is wonderful, but um, that being said, I don't, I don't anticipate supporting 30 recommendations out of this 30. And so it, the way it was presented, it was said multiple times that this is kind of a, these ideas feed off each other. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's been suggested to me at least uh, that if we like this plan, we need to be prepared to like the whole thing, even the parts we don't like. You know, that's, that's what I took away. That was the insinuation I got from Brandon's presentation was that a lot of these feed off each other and you need to be prepared to not micromanage this and just let it happen. And I'm comfortable with a lot of that until we start getting to some of this where I feel like it gets to a punitive nature so far that it's going to actually affect the vibrancy of our downtown. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I heard some of that, but I also heard that the plan has flexibility and it does have. Um, the ability to adjust and change and by the time you get to some of this the reality is you'll have um, better information different information different environmental considerations that are going on in this downtown that will result in a very different you know potential conclusion on some of it you know three I think I think to the point that you're making about the three in the boot I've seen that boot number all over the place, and I'm sure the consultants have too. Um, there, there, are, there are reasons for why the consultants do this based on their experience with other locations. Some of it is not always intuitive, um, but some of this stuff will work. Expanding the hours into the evening is basically a reflection of the town you have now in terms of what's going on in the community and, and moving, you know, some of the margins of the time. And, and if, you, if you, for a moment, say, well, I don't want to charge for those periods of the evening, that's fine. Then what you've done is you've made a, a decision to basically charge that cost back to the, you know, the eight to five type operators. And that's not necessarily equitable either. So 
I think when we get into the weeds of the particular details of these things, you'll get additional information, your public will comment, the business community being the part of the public will comment, you'll have that engagement. I don't think Brandon nor I have any concern about you saying with the caveat that, you know, that these, these specific decisions um, need to at least be run by you, whether you actually have to approve them or not. But, you know, it, 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 we heard what you said, and we're not insensitive or stupid enough to move ahead with some of this stuff and have all the problem. I just as soon know what the problem is before we go down that path than, than wait for it afterwards. So if you want to put a caveat in there, I don't think we have a problem with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tom, if, if, if people don't feel that, um, you know, that uh, abuse the parking in downtown and they get uh, over 50 tickets, why aren't we picking these people up? Brandon? This may actually be a question for Tony, but we don't have the, the enforcement mechanisms in place to do so. Well, to the extent that our um, clerks and prosecutors can, they will um, write, they, the prosecutors will write complaints, a special complaint, and have it served and then call them into court. Um, but as you know, municipal court ha handles um, 34,000 citations a year and 99,000 parking parking um, citations a year so they have a lot of work um, they do make efforts to enforce parking um, but you know it, it falls in line with their other regular duties and, and that's something you know, that we can certainly take a look at I've spent the last 27 years of my career before moving here in two very you know not dissimilar downtowns to what we're dealing with right here and what these consultants are recommending is pretty much, pretty much standard fare for what's going on where successful parking systems work. I think what you do have here is a very disconnected, um, non-contemporary approach to the whole parking issues that face not just your downtown, but the surrounding neighborhoods. And I think the real point that Brandon's trying to make and the consultants are trying to make is, is that you know, you, you do have flexibility in this stuff, but this stuff is all interconnected. That's the most important part of the message that needs to get across. The specific details of the ordinances, of the thresholds for when you go to a stiffer kind of booting a car and towing, those types of things, you will, you'll get there. You'll, you'll figure that out when we bring that stuff back to you. And I'm always surprised, probably not unlike crime in the, wherever you go, that, you know, it's a very small percentage of recidivism occurs in a very small percentage of your population, and that clearly happens in parking. And so you will, you will find, and quite frankly, some of them are your fellow business operators in the downtown who, who, who tend to not understand that those spaces should be for customers, not them and their employees, and you know that. That happens all the time in these downtowns. And so that will start to occur when you start putting some of that enforcement in. They're not helping themselves, some of the businesses. And a lot of them don't want to admit that, but I can tell you from personal experience, they were exposed when we changed some of the provisions in the pre previous two communities I was in. Well, one of the things that I see, and it goes along a little bit with what Matt was talking about, there's, and, and some of what Tom was talking about, there's probably about seven things on here that if we were having the discussion tonight, those would be the seven things, five sure. to seven things that would come off of here that, that if we as a commission, we'd probably have some kind of split votes over. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be very honest with you, the planet, you know, and as long as, you know, that, that we retain that right to, to make the decisions that happen on the right away. I, I think it's fine. Well, it's time to get this moving so we can get on to our next agenda item as well. There's more? We still have number three. <laughs> Sorry. Entering hour three of our meeting. That's right. So um, who wants to make the motion to put this in process? Um, oh. Well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll make the uh, motion to approve the uh, uh, par parking operations and development plan 
but on the um, item that uh, talks about the uh, parking on Edge Hill and, and Ohio, 1109 Ohio. I, I, just, I think that we ought to take that off because those are already established by ordinance. The, the reserved parking that's on Edge Hill and the one that's on Ohio, the gentleman was here. I think we ought to go ahead and, and reserve those as being done uh, and uh, uh, retain those as agreements between this body and the property owner. Is there a second to that? And that all items, all items as they come back for record, all items from this plan come before the governing body. Okay, so we need a, a second to the motion that includes both keeping the Edge Hill and uh, what was the other Ohio. street? Ohio. Ohio Street. Ohio, I think and then also that the decision points come to us for final. Do we? Please. Does your set, I mean, it seems like the second part of your motion makes it to where the first part of your motion doesn't need it. I mean, if all items have to come before us, Shouldn't we wait for them to come before us before we start removing them? Mm -hmm. Either way. That's true. So, I, I mean, I, I think a, a... Is that a friendly a, amendment? A, a, yeah, a friendlier... <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 my motion would be, would be more uh, approve the City of Lawrence Parking System Operations and Development Plan with the understanding that all items on it will come before us. Hold on, hold on. First of all, uh, if I'm, we don't want his amendment, you can either take it off or there's not a second. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my motion back. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So I would move, we approve the City of Lawrence Thank Parking you, System Operations and Development Plan under the understanding that all items on that list will come back to this body for a vote. I second that. All right, so motion made by Commissioner Herbert, seconded by Mayor Soden. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. I'm going to run outside real quick and warm up because I am freezing out here. I know you don't want another break, but I am just shivering. Like crazy. If someone has a jacket. Kept moving. All right. Let's get this thing rolling. I got a jacket from our wonderful AV guy, Kurt Henning. Thank you, Kurt. All right. So now we're on to number three, and that is to consider adopting resolution number 7213, establishing rules and procedures of the governing body. Hi, Jerry. Hello, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, at your June 20th meeting, uh, you discussed some of the current customs and practices for conducting meetings. And at the end of that discussion, directed staff to reinstate the time limit on public comment. It is staff's recommendation that these practices be outlined and adopted. Although there is no state law requiring certain rules of order, it is recommended that some formality expedites meetings and good decision making excuse me, promotes good decision making. Staff is also recommending additional rules and procedures be adopted to ensure equity, transparency, and efficiency. Um, when making these recommendations, 
Staff utilized the Code of Procedures for Kansas Cities, which is published by the League of Kansas Municipalities. We also um, looked at procedures of other Kansas cities, and then um, the city attorney's office uh, reviewed the recommendations. Uh, so the rule, the resolution before you incorporates our current practices and staff recommendations to establish clear rules and procedures governing meetings of the governing body. If it's adopted, it will go into effect on August 1st, and I'll take any questions you have about our recommendations. Okay, any questions? Sure, did you write this? Uh, with a lot of help from Randy. It's excellent. <laughs> That's really good. It is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. So we don't have anything in, in like this in force already? This no. This is all brand new? Well, some of it we have outlined, those that are like statutory, statute, <laughs> sorry, statutory requirements, mm -hmm. like when we have to adopt our meetings right. um, by ordinance and things like that. Do okay. we have a boot and toe policy for public comment? <laughs> <laughs> we can incorporate that if you'd like. Just a friendly <laughs> amendment. <laughs> Any other questions for Seth? No, oh, I think it's great. I like it. Yeah, it is. Great. It, it is. It's, it's a wonderful job. I, I read up there. Wow. Um, we're glad you're happy with Thank it. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's do public comment then. Is there any public comment on this item? Uh, Dennis Brown, I guess I'd like to ask a question on the public comment. Matt, you stole my joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I read in the staff report a couple days ago, did I read it wrong or is something changing that the policy would be to go to a three minute shot clock? Mm -hmm. Do I have that wrong? That's, uh, it's, it's in, in here. here, it's in here. Yeah. Okay. Section 5B. That's what I'd like to speak to a little bit. Um, maybe I should just comment, but, okay. I think, but I think addendum to that is a statement that it is the presiding officer that gets to, you know, if there's going to be some leeway that they can do that. So, but is there any direction on what, how that leeway is come to? No, there is not. I think that um, you can't borrow time from other speakers and mm -hmm. things of I that sort. Agree with that. Um, but you know, somebody's somebody's mid-sentence trying to complete a thought i think that you know that that's a typical way to you know allow somebody to trip over that that threshold um and and, and it's not uncommon that 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 happens i think what's happened is that there's a suggestion that in in some cases some speakers are speaking way longer others are being encouraged to move on and, so this was an attempt to get back, I think, by the commission to a more standard approach to that, that mm -hmm. time limit and enforcing mm -hmm. that and keeping the meeting moving along. I would Just like to, that's the background. Yeah, I appreciate that, Tom. I would like to speak to it a little bit because really what we're trying to find is a balance. I think I speak uh, to the city commission maybe eight times a year. I'm almost always representing a group, a nonprofit group, the Lawrence Preservation Alliance. And, and as I think about it, I think I've probably been doing it for almost 20 years. Uh, so I've seen almost every different commission I've addressed uh, try to deal with balancing public comment. Uh, and it's a moving target, it's, it's really tricky. I know that if, if you just let things go and and uh, just let the public police themselves. I've seen people talk 10, 15 and upwards minutes and everybody's just going, what's going on? You know, when's my agenda item coming up? It's not fair to the commission or the staff or the people waiting for their own agenda item. Uh, I've also been on a three minute shot clock with the shot clock sitting right up there while I'm, I'm trying to uh, talk and then, oh, oh my God, you know, there's a minute and a half off already. Uh, I think th when you get to the three minute shot clock, uh, that works for a lot of public comments, but when you're in a really difficult, complex situation, I'm thinking the Oriad Hotel or things like that, things that will come up in the future that will be difficult, um, 
and complex, that's where three minutes gets kind of tough. Uh, when there also are individuals or individuals working with groups that spend their entire year focusing and studying and learning more about a particular facet of things that you make rulings on, those folks have some degree of expertise uh, that they can impart to you and give you information that you need to make the best decisions. And if you're trying to do that and you have three minutes, that's kind of tough. Another thing I'd like to say is you sometimes get into uh, neighbors who had never been the city commission before, maybe never even turned it on, but oh, here's a big development project in their backyard where they thought the lot was gonna be vacant and they're scrambling around for two or three weeks to try to figure out the nature of the problem and how they interact with their city government and then they come down and there's a three minute shot clock. I think that is problematic as well. Uh, I know some of the commissions that uh, in the past have done a three minute clock, but if you represent an established group, then you can get five minutes. Uh, another thing I find as an oddity, we keep going from five minutes to three minutes Maybe four. No one's ever tried four. Maybe that's the just right number. I don't know, but either one of those I would feel better about than a straight three minute and or else we're going to boot and toe your mouth. <laughs> uh, so I'd just like to bring that up and hope that you'll consider that before you pass this policy. Otherwise, I think the rest of the policy is very well thought out and fine. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Any other public comment? Good evening, Commissioners. Dustin Stumlin Bear, 211 Mount Hope Court. I want to say ditto to the majority of what he said and just add in that most of us, yourselves, myself, several of the others, including the previous conferee, we are practice public speakers and so to think about that shot clock if you're going to use it at least use it where you can see it i would ask that you don't use it i've been in the kansas house of uh, representatives and conference conferences where there's been a lot of conferees the chairman of the committee will dictate how much time each one has to spend and then they hold you to it and they're pretty forceful about it there's nothing wrong with you doing that as well i understand we're city we're closer in our relationship with one another because we have to live with one another in the same city so that's kind of difficult but I'd ask that you don't abdicate your responsibility as the presiding authority over these meetings to an inanimate object like a shot clock and if you do use it please use it with discretion in regards to unpracticed public speakers thank you thank you Dustin any other public comment Frank Jansen same address on New Hampshire uh, I've looked at the the parking things but this particular item on this agenda which uh, is on the internet I didn't actually open this up so I don't know about uh, the shot clock and is there anything else important in this particular uh, resolution that we should know about about the procedures of the City Commission thank you Frank Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Hayden Maples and I live in the Deerfield area. And it's the second half of that intro that I'd like to comment on tonight. Section five, subsection A of the resolution encourages persons making public comment to state their name and address. That language is similar to what's already on the agenda. And in my limited time watching or attending these meetings, I've heard specific addresses given, streets or areas provided instead of an address, or folks dive right in without providing their name, let alone a location. So I understand this resolution intends to solidify that kind of procedure and that it's not a requirement, but I'd like to understand what the purpose is of having people's address on record. When I showed my wife the statement I made last week, she was taken aback that I had shared our address on YouTube. I was a little hesitant to do so, but wasn't overly concerned about it. But her reaction made me consider it further, and I'm worried this request may deter some people from speaking. Some individuals may fear retribution for their comments or worry about judgment based on their address or lack thereof. 
I'm assuming the address is desirable to confirm those speaking are actually from Lawrence and to know how different parts of town feel about given issues. So my first question is, are there other reasons I haven't considered? And then either way, would a more general location suffice or even no location? With the return of the shot clock, maybe with amendments, the biggest cost I see is three minutes listening to a non Laurentian concerned enough to show up and speak. To me, that's a small price to pay to remove a hurdle that could be preventing someone from sharing valuable insight. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Hagen. Any other public comment? KT Walsh, um, 732 Rhode Island. Go ahead and steal my identity if you want to. <laughs> you can have it. Um, no, actually, I thought that his comments were excellent, and I hadn't even thought about the safety issue. But what I would like to say is that um, three minutes, especially it's an educational opportunity when we get up here. I feel like our job is to impart information to you all that you may not know or a perspective. Three minutes is you really have to speed. And it's, um, it's hard for people to absorb information that quickly. And last time this came up under Mayor Farmer when you were trying to fix this, um, I advocated for four minutes and five minutes if, if you're representing a group. So as with Dennis, I vote for four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, KT. Hey, uh, Courtney Shibley, 1125 Gaswold. Um, this is interesting for two, two reasons. Um, it would be easier to take seriously if you actually pulled it up on the monitor so we could read it. So we would know that you really meant it. And number two, um, it's funny, a couple of you, at least that I can think of, ran on getting more public engagement with Facebook and Twitter. And some of you, some people think, were elected by those social media. And now you guys want to make sure that the people who do show up are just speaking short enough. They're not taking up too much of your time, right? So which, which is it? You want a lot of public engagement? Or you want to go home early? Just all well, I wondered. Thank you, Corey. Can I make another quick comment? Sure. Just on the time front, in case people hadn't seen it, the language's request for additional time may be granted at the discretion of the presiding officer. So on that front, I think three minutes is plenty of time to present general concepts and then ask if the commission is interested for more information on any of those specific topics. Thank you. Uh, Dan, Dannenberg, 2702 University Drive. Um, as a uh, frequent commenter, uh, quite obnoxious and uh, combative, adversarial, I think that the time for an individual speaker should be five minutes with the discretion of the mayor to grant an additional two minutes but that's it. In three minutes, there's not a lot you can get said. You really have to have your thoughts organized, you have to have everything together, and there is not enough time to say what you really want to say. And if I'm booted and towed or whatever, tarred and feathered or however it goes, uh, so what? But I think you have to set a limit of five minutes with the discretion of the mayor, an additional two minutes. No more than seven minutes. I was uh, cut off. I, I brought my little timer this evening because I wanted to see just how long I could last. And I was cut off at three and a half minutes. Fine. But I should have had five minutes and then the mayor could have said, that's it. You don't get an additional two minutes. But five minutes should be the number. And if we have instances where there is a group, I think we ought to have a representative of the group speak for that five minutes. And then if there needs to be additional uh, time, the additional two minutes comes in. Uh, these meetings could go on uh, ad nauseum. And, uh, I think the five minute rule with the additional two minutes at the discretion of the mayor is appropriate. Thank you, Dan. 
Yes, Frank? Yeah, the other, some time ago when there was a huge crowd here and then Mayor Soden actually had a, like there were like 12 or 15 people back here and Mayor Soden said, you know, can I have one person please, you know, for all the groups, not just have everybody come up one by one. Thanks. Are you suggesting that is a good idea or a bad idea? <laughs> okay, thank yeah, you. A good idea thank you. Thank you. If you got a dozen people, well, you don't want everybody comfortable for three minutes. Right, right, right. Oh, let's. Okay, no, no, no. Let's not. Okay, we'll talk. I'll talk to you later about that, KT. Okay. Um, any other public comment? <laughs> I think almost everyone has. I'm waiting for Jennifer and Anna. Okay. All right. So we'll bring it back to the commission. Well, I want to address the piece about public engagement because I think the shot clock, I would argue, actually benefits public engagement. A lot of people work in the morning given that we have meetings on Tuesday nights. And when we had a series of meetings that went until, you know, one week it was 12.30, the week after that it was 1.30, people that get up at 8 in the morning aren't going to sit in that chair until 1.30 to get up and speak. So my argument would be, you know, Courtney, I hear you and I understand what you're saying. The shot clock, my intention is to improve public engagement because as a private citizen, if I know, you know, to get up and say my three minutes, I'm gonna have to sit in a chair till 1.30 in the morning so that I can, and then I get up and go to work at Lawrence High School at 7.20 in the morning. I'm not gonna sit in that chair till 1.30. I'm just not gonna show to the meeting. But if I know that I can go to the meeting have the meeting adjourned by 9 o'clock at night, well, I'll, I'll show up and get engaged and be active. This in no way, shape, or form is, a, in my opinion, was designed to stop public engagement. It was designed to actually increase it. I think the night it was proposed, I remember sitting right there next to uh, Michael Allman, was a young woman who I'd never seen here before. I think it might have been our first city commission meeting. And I overheard, because this room, you can hear everyone talking. It's this weird sound chamber. And she turned to Michael Allman and she goes, do they never cut people off? And then I sat and watched her. We took a break and she left. And I never heard what she had to say because she wasn't going to sit here till midnight. So we have no idea what she thought. We have no idea what her input was because we actually silenced her in the absence of a shot clock. So uh, I think, you know, coming organized with your thoughts, knowing you have a three minute barrier, I don't think that's a bad thing. Any other thoughts? I think this is what we asked for, frankly, and I appreciate it. I think it's very well written. And on top of that, I think that the mayor is given the discretion of being able to um, uh, grant additional time, and I, you know, I would even go so far as to say that if uh, the mayor has the authority based on the issue that's before us, that the individual could actually say, okay, it could be in addition to three minutes, I mean, it could be four minutes, five minutes, whatever it may be, I believe the mayor has that authority with the, even with the blessing of the commission or even without the blessing, you are the presiding officer. You have the way to do that. I think you have that authority, you know, you can, you can make those decisions. I, I think it's also useful for people who want to come and make public comment to read the resolution and see how we, how we conduct our meetings. I think that's a piece that has been lacking because we haven't had it actually spelled out. And this is actually spelled out very well. So, thank you. Mayor, Mayor the only other thing, mm -hmm. the, the, the question of addresses, um, you know, I, I've never thought about somebody replacing somebody in harm's way. Uh, the, why do we have the reason for addresses? Yeah. Well, the resolution as written says that persons making public comment are encouraged to sign in, so it is not an absolute requirement but it, it does provide some information it helps with our um, minute taking and record keeping so they are encouraged but if someone feels strongly that they do not want to identify the precise address we're not going to not take their public comment and then if I could just um, respond to Mr. Jansen's questions at the end about how um, grouping people mm -hmm. um, and having them having one person speak um, this resolution is we set some time parameters with the hope that everyone would have an opportunity to speak and that they could be accommodated. Um, if people came to a public meeting and didn't know that they would be grouped and only one person was allowed to speak, they may feel like they, they were censored. And this body um, prefers to take 
public comment and has a very strong tradition of taking public comment. So uh, we're trying to provide a system where public comment can be made in an efficient manner and, and many people can speak. Mm -hmm. Tony, I was going to actually send you an email about this just in private, but I figured, I mean, we're having this discussion. Does our city commission have a policy about requiring an individual to be a citizen of Lawrence in order to take part? No, we often okay. have people from the county or even even from other communities address us, and that's permitted, and no, it's been our practice. Um, we're all from the county, Tony. <laughs> we're from the county. We're all from the county. Well, I just I always think of, <laughs> But know, we're not from this, all from the city. When we were, not when we were doing the, the Amtrak <laughs> discussions, Mr. Kennedy would always show up, you know, and, and his input's very valuable, but he'd always say, you know, Lake Domino or whatever, and it's like, shh. <laughs> so I just was wondering if we had a policy on that. One thing I wanted to ask about the um, shot clock, is it, what, where is that at on here? Is there any guidance on its location or anything like that? Or is it just three minutes? Because I don't remember. It's at 5B five, five is where it's mentioned. First paragraph of 5, the first thing is a 5B. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily say that it needs to be front and center right in the view of someone that's speaking because a, a shot clock can be very intimidating i am concerned about that right and you need to admit it doesn't specify in the past we've had it because it the shot clock you can see from both sides mm -hmm. and i mean it, i need to be able to see it to give you notice that we're at three so right you can notify them but generally it's helpful for people as well so they know to wrap up their comments did the shot clock in the past count down or count up do you think that matters? It counts up. Okay. I think I think where I've seen it used, and I've never in the 40 years I've been in the business ever had a, a governing board use it. I, I'm not opposed to that, but I think the reason that goes with it being somewhat publicly displayed mm -hmm. is it adds transparency to the whole idea that Here's the minutes. Everybody's being treated the same way. Mm -hmm. Everybody can see it. That's right. how the, the Lawrence School Board, uh, USD 497 School Board, uses an, an actual shot clock, and it sits up on the, you know, up on their dais, pointed out towards the point speaker. O, point over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when year, years ago, and and uh, and when we had Dave Corliss, the, the shot clock was over there. Was, <laughs> That's yeah. Good for Dave. It's wonderful but to be able. Under to, you, we should put it closer <laughs> to your heart. It's wonderful to be able to provide you a new experience. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think it. It, it would be good. For this isn't the first one. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever this timing device that we use, that it not be so intimidating in its location. I mean, we can experiment with whether we're going to. I don't have any, you know, solutions right now that I can say that this is good, this is not, but I think that is important. And there is something about the, um, the letters on a shot clock that just invites stress. <laughs> I don't well, I mean, know why. Technically, the wording, the, way of, the, dots are, the, wording yeah. of the ordinance, it does say um, that the city clerk may utilize a timing device. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from my perspective, if we have a meeting and it looks like it does tonight where we have eight people in the audience, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think we need to bring out the shot clock and you know when when Hayden goes 315 we start yelling at him but we've had meetings where we've had you know this room full and then 40 more people out there and mm -hmm. the, everybody wants to speak I think that's an appropriate time to have the shot clock. Mm -hmm. Well that's kind of the thing is I think we should always use it we shouldn't make okay. That could be really subjective how that's decided. Okay. And that's kind of the point of the timing device is to remove the subjectivity as well. Okay. Mayor, I, I think at the end of the day, you always retain authority to change the way you do things. Mm -hmm. Try it, see if it works. If you need to add some time to it, add the time, see what happens, you know, how it gets administered, you know, that, I mean, it's a comfort level. You'll get enough feedback from our community to tell you it needs to change. Try it, see how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's something we're definitely going to experiment with. And but I hate the actual shot clock that we, we've used in the past. I really despise that piece of equipment. I would like something a little more friendly to look at. <laughs> it's what I'm saying. 
Yeah. Well, I like the I like the way it was written up. I'm just amazed that we didn't have something like this before. It mm -hmm. just boggles my mind that how old of a city we are. We we don't have rules about government and how how we run our meeting. Mm -hmm. um, just for full um, disclosure, I think at one point our city code did say that we followed Robert's rules of order, but um, that is such a a complex and very detailed book it that sure is. Um, everyone couldn't remember all the rules <laughs> and so it was discarded no. <laughs> and we and we just tried to operate by you know best you know procedures. when we went to the National League of Cities I went to a Roberts rules and I just I was flabbergasted there it was insane mm -hmm. it's just like thank God we don't use this well you but, know but try and use a little common sense even places that have Roberts rules of order still have a procedure a governance mm -hmm. procedure that's separate and distinct because Roberts rules of order not just about the conduct of the meeting but appropriate motions are very detailed mm -hmm. um, you know calls for you know the, the sequence of things that you have to do in terms of voting on things very much spelled out you almost need a parliamentarian I was going to ask on the parliamentarian to <laughs> handle the Roberts rules yeah. of order for you but but this I think is kind of a step in the right direction for consistency because one thing that your public should count on when they come in here is that you know there's kind of an understanding of how the conduct of the meeting will take place right. and I think this is a really good start I yeah. I was really happy I didn't think it was overly onerous no. in terms of you know all of the the provisions you know you can argue about the number of minutes and you know maybe you'll get to a point where you kick it up or I don't see you kicking it down but mm -hmm. um, like I said, try it, play with it for a while. And see what yeah, happens. we're gonna have to experiment. Yeah, <clears throat> we'll be experimenting, Dennis. Okay, so um, any other thoughts on this? Motion to adopt. Second. All right, you guys said that at exactly the same time. No, I didn't know. You said first. Okay. All right. Motion made by Commissioner Herbert. Well, we probably need to state what we're doing <laughs> to uh, adopt resolution number 7213, establishing the rules and procedures of the governing body of the city of Lawrence. Do you still want to make that motion? I do. Okay. So, motion made by Commissioner Herbert, seconded by Vice Mayor Bully. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Sherry. All right, so now we're on to commission items. Any commissioner items? Okay, so city manager's report. Yeah, we, we did have a pre-meeting this evening, and I want to tell you as, you know, not having been around for that experience, I thought it was really well done this evening, mm -hmm. and, and I thought there was a lot of strong support for what had happened and continuing down that vein, so I thought it was, really well uh, organized and and um, I was impressed by the the attendance and the uh, participation um, I'm not going to hit every item but I want to point out some of the highlights uh, our finance director did respond to the editorial uh, on the 2018 budget um, uh, Mr. D D uh, Dannenberg raised the question about whether he could he, he had trouble getting into it and Casey spoke to him during one of the breaks and uh, she's actually sent him the article so he'll have a chance to read that hopefully it, it makes sense but you all received that memo and and uh, I'm not sure it's actually appeared in the newspaper at this time or not not yet, not no. yet. <clears throat> okay We're in talks. We're okay in talks. okay um, <laughs> It's too long. <laughs> On the East 9th Street project, um, the ar architectural services agreement um, as to whether it was followed and whether we received the product that we had contracted for, um, we've attached a memo from Porter <coughs> O'Neill. He went through it, and I think that um, he accurately displays um, what was produced as a result of that contract and he points out the consistencies um, that were met by the contractor for that so I'll leave it at that um, there was some discussion uh, I think emanating from the county uh, board meeting and it was the issue of land application of septage 
versus um, individuals that um, have their septic tanks pumped, uh, delivering it to a waste treatment facility. I thought the utilities department did an excellent job explaining the process and what's involved in that and the impact on our treatment plant and the cost of that and that if the way our fees are currently structured are probably not set up to recover our costs so um, we'll, we'll, we will when we're evaluating fees um, have to look at that and probably update that but uh, part of the reason for the expansion, expansion of the plant is for capacity for future growth and this would absorb a, a fairly significant part of, of growth by taking it. The other thing that I think utilities points out quite accurately is it's a burden shift. Um, septics are you know, typically located in the unincorporated uh, areas of the county and to move that um, liability or that responsibility over to the treatment facilities shifts the liability for that back to the city from those that are generating that. So I thought that those were all very good points. I think that um, apparently the city was encouraged, I don't know who by, possibly the county, to, to provide some sort of receiving station for this material um, in the past and the prediction was that it wouldn't get used because the cost that you'd have to charge to recover your cost for that and the operational impacts uh, would probably be such a detraction that people wouldn't use it. So I don't think this is a, a growth industry that we wish to pursue uh, in terms of our taking this product. Um, in terms of um, um, communications, um, we had a uh, representative of the public come forward and indicate to us that felt that all of the correspondence that submitted to me or to the uh, city commission should be uh, ensconced in the you know the official records of the city. I think that that is a uh, maybe a burden beyond what the individual thought it might be. But in an attempt to try and maybe appease and find some middle ground on that, we're going to examine this, um, this uh, electronic file that we could um, house that material in when we get materials from the public that isn't marked confidential or isn't um, beyond uh, normal civil conversation in a, um, um, a memo that might come in and we could uh, place that into a file that could be um, received and noted by the public. So I think that that's an attempt to at least address that issue, but I think like procedures for the city commission, we should probably have procedures for that before we jump into opening up a file and, and not having anything that's um, legally drafted that says what will go in and what won't. So we're going to um, study that and then get back to you on that. But we're not just shutting off the possibility of that particular issue at this point. Uh, future agendas, I'm just going to address the very next one. You now have the Catalyst Project moving back uh, for that agenda. We have the public hearing on the revised 17 budget, uh, or uh, revised 17 and 18 budget adoption, adopt. Adoption of the first reading of our rate ordinances, the sales tax education plan, final Friday street party public hearing, and the 2017 live on mass uh, public um, hearing as well. In terms of work sessions, the 8817 will have the advisory report. That was one of our strategic plan objectives was to look at was there a way to consolidate some of them, uh, some of our advisory reports? But we're also going to come back with some kind of policy recommendations as to, you know, maybe appointment process, um, maybe length of service, um, those types of issues. And again, you know, I think we spent a lot of time trying to refine some of this stuff down to the Nat's eyebrow. And in fact, over time, we can add to these things. So I would say to you, we'll come back with some policy recommendations, listen to the public, listen to the commission, um, add those comments, and then recognize that that can be added on to as we go forward in time. So that's my report. Thank you.
All right, so we're on to the calendar. The items to be added, any other forums, candidate forums that you feel need to be added? Mm -hmm. I tried not to go to them to not <clears throat> accidentally at the meeting. There's a meet and greet one on the 22nd, but I don't, I assume none of you are coming to meet us. I don't know, Stuart, Stuart you might, you've been to the forum, so. Okay, any other meetings then? Okay. All right, I think that's it. I move we adjourn. Second. All right, motion made by Commissioner Amix to adjourn, seconded by Commissioner Herbert. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thanks, everyone. So.